I'd like to introduce our first speaker, George Podnyadakis from Applied uh, Department, Applied Math Department from Brown. Thank you. Um, for uh, more than 10 years now, almost 15, this uh, MSM consortium has uh, been a wonderful environment, a uh, perhaps unique environment that fosters the um, kind of full push relationship between development of multi scale methods and, um, um, and, and uh, applications in uh, biological systems. Um, and there are many methods that have been developed uh, by our colleagues. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about that, a link to the past, but mostly talk about what Dr. Brennan has started, uh, the uh, data-driven modeling and the uh, seamless integration, methods on seamless integration between models uh, and data. So uh, when you have data, you have uncertainty. Data are variable fidelity, and you have to propagate that uncertainty. We also have models, so we may not need that much data because we have conservation laws. So we'll see how we can use those to infer. So it will be a combination of inferring from data but also models. So unlike just the big data where you try to infer everything from data, we can use these conservation laws. So nothing will be lost uh, in a sense from what we have achieved. But the paradigm is about to change, I think. It is changing, including um, the paradigm in scientific computing, uh, not just in data science. Uh, so if we look at this uh, picture here, let's say we want to compute the forces. This is a project on traumatic brain injury, with, uh, MIT and um, MGH a few years ago. So try to compute the forces. You have a finite element mesh there. We can compute the forces. Uh, but of course, we need to know the constitutive laws for the uh, soft tissue in the brain, that's an unknown. So we have to solve an, 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 an inverse problem. We have to, from data, and using a deterministic finite element solver, I have to infer uh, a sort of deterministic sort of constitutive law that will apply for all brains, not just the pigs, but perhaps the humans. So there's so many uncertainties here. So how would you just take one uh, relationship and use it el elsewhere? I want to address that, this uh, propagation of uncertainty, together with the multi-fidelity of the data and the modeling. Uh, how do I ch change the... Oh, it's from mouse, just click. Uh, thank you. So, um, if I just look at this application here, which is more typical of... Um, what we're doing in MSM is looking at the brain vascular through. We want to go from the protein level all the way to the organ. And one method will not cover everything. So we have different methods and overlaps and uh, linking the two scales, at least two scales. That's part of the requirement of being a grantee in, uh, in this project. But again, there's all these uncertainties that you have to propagate from all the way from the nano scale to, uh, to a centimeter or, or, uh, or beyond. So, um, these um, issues have been dealt with in the past. In fact, uh, in the 2010 consortium meeting, we uh, produced a paper, a white paper, that uh, then we turn it to a special issue later. Uh, and we discussed these topics. I'm not going to go all these numerical methods that we concentrated, but if I uh, look at the number seven, where the data comes in, and number nine and number ten, they talk about we talk about uncertainty in material properties, boundary conditions, geometry, and then sensitivity and uncertainty propagation in multi scale and multi physics integration, that means for the entire uh, system. So this it was turned into a um, special issue, as I, as I said, uh, on uh, multi scale modeling in the general computational physics. Uh, and this slide is to show you that, uh, ma uh, that these topics are cross cutting multi scale modeling and uncertainty quantification. So it doesn't matter if you deal with cardiovascular systems, respiratory systems, proteins, bone mechanics, 
or, or, or predicting the outcomes of a surgery. There are several papers to, to discuss that. Now, again, if I look at our data, um, just like to quote uh, Norbert Wiener, who pioneered stochastic processes and stochastic modeling thinking, uh, our data can never be precise. And I sort of feel like that uh, when I work with um, all my colleagues and experimentalists. So uh, there's another quote here from a Percy Diaconis, a statistician at Stanford University, where he first wrote this paper on how you can actually solve equations, differential equations, just by from measurement. Uh, and you never know exactly the right-hand side f of x or the process that you're trying to model. You know a little bit about it, but you, you're not going to have an analytical relationship. So the moment you just know a little bit and you have all these uncertainties, you introduce a Bayesian approach. We'll hear more later about it, but I will also uh, include it here in my talk. And, and um, So I will give you an example where we actually solve PDs instead of where we remove the tyranny of the grid. Uh, we don't have to have boundary conditions everywhere because you, you compute the posterior con condition, condition on data, so the data could be anywhere. In fact, it could be data of multi-fidelity. Typically, in a situation you have data which is called gold data, two, three, four measurements which are very, very accurate, but very expensive to obtain. And then you have silver data of different grades. So how do you combine uh, this to construct an F from which you can predict the solution? That will be part of, of a topic. So just an outline, I'll briefly introduce the Gaussian process regression. Uh, what is multi-fidelity? It's a very powerful concept, it's agnostic to applications. I think you, uh, uh, you will find that you could use it in, in your own research. And then I will give you an example of uh, PDSD uh, using machine learning. So a Gaussian process, uh, uh, you can think of a Gaussian process by starting, uh, a, by considering a multivariate Gaussian distribution, uh, just two data set A and B and you take the joint uh, distribution. If you can take that, if you can generalize that to an infinite system, uh, then you have a stochastic process. So you have a prior over functions, uh, which I show that in the upper uh, uh, sketch, the graph. So you have samples of uh, a, a, a GP prior, uh, which is characterized by some mean value and, and the kernel K, the very important kernel K. Now in that kernel K, as you can see, we have the displacement x and x prime, but also we have this theta, the set of hyperparameters that we're trying to learn. So it's not a deterministic kernel, the cell, it, it's a stochastic process, so we're trying to, from the data, to infer uh, k. Now, the prior is very important, but, and, and that's where the discipline comes in, because we can use disciplinary knowledge to come up with the right prior. And, and that's very important. We're not just operating in the dark, we have conservation laws, we have momentum, we have energy, we have transport. 120 equations in coagulation uh, for reactive transport. So, so we know some of it, so we, <clears throat> we want to use it. Now, if you have a prior, just do the math, if you have the prior, which is Gaussian, then it turns out that the posterior condition, some data is also Gaussian, and that's on the bottom of the of this slide, you can see you can infer both the mean and the variance. Now, this language of Gaussian processes is not unique. Uh, people who work on deep networks use similar concepts. If we <clears throat> come up with the kernel machines, it's the same idea, but we're talking about Bayesian inference based on data and models, as I'll show you. So just uh, for those who have never seen what a Gaussian process regression is before, you have data Y and you put a model F, which is a Gaussian process, as we said, uh, and then you have a bias epsilon. Now, the bias epsilon is not just a constant. It will be also a kernel with parameterized also with another set of other parameters, which are the same and we try to learn. So the workflow is as follows. We assign a Gaussian process prior over all the functions that, uh, for this model F, then given a training set of observations, X for locations, Y for the uh, uh, data, we calibrate this hy GP hyperparameters theta. And then we use the conditional posterior, F, condition on Y, the data, to infer predictions. So if you have just a few data, you can see from the left um, panel to the right, on the left uh, side of the, of, of the uh, slide, we go from a prior with a very large uncertainty, we go to a more limited number of possible functions having only three, four data uh, points. Now, how exactly you choose the kernels is very important. Uh, I, my preference is uh, on these modern uh, variances that depend on these uh, Bessel functions because you can basically reproduce the exponential function 
You can have different smoothness, you can have different correlation length, and you can treat a lot of different things under that one class of uh, maternal. Uh, they have some other properties that I will not talk about up here. So now I want to talk about this multi-fidelity modeling. Usually we have a very fine resolution on a very nice model, but we cannot, we cannot run it because it's too expensive. So you have to do like a hero simulation, but you cannot afford in this environment where you have uncertainty, you cannot really sample a thousand times or a hundred thousand times an expensive model. So you have to resort to some other, either empirical information, uh, reduce all the model or something else. I'll, do, I'll demonstrate this with a very simple example here. So let's say we try to discover on the left panel this black curve. I want to discover this uh, from data. And I only have four gold data. The gold data is these circles. These are the expensive data. So from this gold data, the best I can do, in fact, this Gaussian process regression is the best you can do. You cannot beat it. Uh, it's, um, so the best you can do is this red posterior, the dash red curve posterior. And that's the best you can do. You can also, at the same time, you predict, and that's very important, you predict simultaneously, not just the mean field, but also you predict the uncertainty. Now, that's where the uncertainty, that's where you want to reduce that uncertainty. And the question is, how do you do that? One way is, of course, to have more gold, more gold data, but gold is expensive, we know that. So you want to go to silver, you want to go to lower fidelity data, if possible. So this lower fidelity data will be simulations and models. We know our models, it could be uncalibrated models, for example. So as a model, Z2 here will represent my gold data, but Z1 will represent my model. The model is a cheaper model, and you can see here this blue curve is not doing a very good job. It's actually order 100% errors, but the trends are pretty good. So it turns out that if I use 3, 5, 7, actually 11 points, if I use 11 points for my low fidelity model, I totally nail that function. I discover this blue curve. In fact, on the right panel, you cannot see any uncertainty because I have discovered totally extremely small uncertainty, this, just using 11 silver data and only four data, okay? Where's the magic? Well, the magic is here. You simply, uh, you have a simple to regressive scheme on the upper part of uh, the left side of the, of the slide, where FT is the higher level, the gold data, let's say, and you upscale the silver data, FT minus one, times a correlation function. But that could depend on space time, for example, X here, could be space-time, plus a bias that is represented by this kernel delta. Now, you're going to learn raw on the fly, the correlation. You also are going to learn the hyperparameters of this, of the uh, uncertainty delta, but also uh, of all these processes. So by doing that, uh, and this is, was done first by the seminal paper by Kennedy and O'Hagan uh, about 15 years ago. It turns out that you can have more levels of this hierarchy it's up to you, of course, to define what is gold data, what is silver data, what is higher fidelity, intermediate fidelity. But in the simplest case, imagine you run this finite element simulation of the, on, on the pig uh, head. Uh, so you can have uh, different resolutions. You can have really very fine resolutions, but a few of them, and then have a lot of other resolutions, intermediate and, uh, and, and very low resolution, in fact. Or you can have a different model, a simplified model, nonlinear versus linear, and I'll show you an example of that. Now, there are some technicalities about how you can make this efficient, but this is the linear model. So you say the, linear, the, the uh, low fidelity model here is really bad. Well, it's not so bad because you can see that if you, if you construct the correlation, the correlation is pretty good. As you can see, at least the slopes are very similar. So the trends are very consistent. The absolute values don't match. So a linear model here actually captures that this is a linear concept. This autoregressive scheme is a linear concept. But we're all very ambitious in our research. So what we do, we usually we take a low dimensional model and we use it where we shouldn't use, be using it, in a regime that is not trained, in a regime that is not really working pro properly. So what do you do? How do you safeguard against erroneous low fidelity models, well, against reduced order models which are erroneous? Here, if the correlation is zero, it doesn't contribute. But imagine if you have anti-correlation. So in other words, the low fidelity could pull you in the wrong direction. And this happens in biological systems. We do have this case. So what, what happens? So it turns out that there's progress can be made. And uh, I, I will show you, I'll skip this. I will show you this, how we go from the linear, this linear concept to the nonlinear concept. So to, what I have here on the, on, the, on the top is this regression, the two-level regression. It could be 10-level regression, as I said, uh, of, of high fidelity, low fidelity 
to be intermediate fidelity. But now I want to, to replace rho times f1 of x with some nonlinear function, so f2 will be a nonlinear function g2, which I will try to discover. So if I go for, I, so, so now the problem is of course more complex, I need more data, but I'm going to discover the function g of 2 from data, the nonlinear function. So if I do that, then that's what will override. So I will know the, I will know how to safeguard against erroneous predictions of the low fidelity. One way to, to do that, the simplest one which we have recently published, is actually to take rho and make it also a stochastic process. And so you parameterize that with another set of parameters that you learn on the fly. I'll give you an example of this, it's easier. So let's say we try to discover, in this upper left panel, we try to discover this very oscillatory blue function. As you can see, that the amplitude changes in time, and I have points, only these marked crosses, on the blue curve. That's what is given. Below Nyquist frequency, there's no way you can reconstruct that from the data. In fact, if I do a single fidelity GP on the right, you can see that the posterior, the dashed red line, is no, no way close to, to um, the real curve, which is the blue curve that I want to predict. And in fact, the uncertainty is very large. How about if I use the low fidelity? And what's low fidelity here is this red curve. The red curve, as you can see, is given, so I can sample that, that's my low fidelity model. But every other period, that low fidelity pulls me the wrong direction. For example, in the first period, uh, the correct answer is the amplitude negative, but the low fidelity, the low dimensional model gives me positive amplitude. So that's anti-correlated. How do you deal with that? Well, there's, then there's another period where, where there's a good agreement and I can use those data. So the idea I get here is to discover the correlation of high fidelity, low fidelity as the stochastic process itself. In this fabricated example, I have a, para a parabola, this parabola that changes in, in, uh, in space, as you can see, with the blue curve and the red curve. In fact, we discover that. If you try to do the linear concept, you can see here on the right that the linear concept actually, the, the, the linear multifidelity does worse than the single fidelity. But if you do, if you discover the correlation, this manifold, this nonlinear manifold, you actually nail the function uh, using erroneous, some erroneous information, some good information from the low fidelity. So there are ways to safeguard it. And the idea is very simple for those who are more mathematically inclined. You can see here in this, how you construct the manifold, the low fidelity is on the floor. You, you have this low fidelity you project first into the manifold, and then from the manifold now you have a smooth uh, upscaling up from the manifold onto the high fidelity, which is this vertical axis, and that's how this is being constructed. So you can have low fidelity models which are, help you only ha halfway. So in this framework, this multi-fidelity framework, we say that no simulation is left behind, or no data set, in fact. All data set could be used because we propagate uncertainty for any data set and for any uh, simulation. Now that's very useful. Multi-fidelity is very useful, especially when we deal with inverse problems. And we deal with, uh, uh, with this all the time because either we have to optimize the device or we have to uh, estimate parameters under uncertainty. That's where this multi-fidelity comes in because you have to interrogate the system not just once, but many, many times. And you really cannot afford to, to, to run your forward solver at full speed and, and uh, high resolution. So, so here there's the concept of acquisition functions. Because you predict the uncertainty at the same time, you can also look at the curvature of the solution. You can construct acquisition functions and you can put them points. If you want to do one more measurement, where would that be? And you can see here in this sketch, you find exactly where that will be. Also, using this underlying mathematics, you can say, should I invest on gold or should I invest on silver? What would be an expensive? It depends on your budget, but also it depends on how much the uncertainty is. So you, you can schedule your experiments, for example, uh, your acquisition strategies according, according to this. So it's a very effective technique. I just want to show you very quickly an example that we did here in a paper we published where we try to, we have too much information on the inflow, but we truncate this bifurcation, so we don't know what is downstream. It turns out that you can parameterize and you can find, you want to find these parameters downstream in the outflow uh, from the flow rate that you have and the pressure, physiologically correct pressure. So uh, you can find a minimum like that. I just want to, to show you that only with three iterations, instead of running the 3D simulations, we run three 3D simulations, the high fidelity. The intermediate simulation was a 1D model nonlinear and then we use 60 points from the low fidelity. This is a stochastic response surface. You can see the low fidelity is not, is not exactly lying on the exact surface, but it helps you 
to do a lot of things. I want, I want to finish with just one more intriguing thing that we can actually solve PDs using that without any knowledge of PDs. And now I say that even computer scientists with this can solve PDs. They usually don't like to do that. So let's, <laughs> let's take an example of this, uh, let's say the first, the, the first equation. This is linear, but we can extend to nonlinear. The idea is to take a U2, the solution, the high fidelity, <clears throat> make it a, a GP process, then because of the linearity in the equation, you push through, and then the right-hand side, F, is also a GP. So now, with some simple math, you can relate the covariances of the, <clears throat> the right-hand side to the solution, but you postulate the, the, co the covariance of the solution with parameters, and therefore you can actually find K. So if you find K, then you sample the solution. And here's an example. This is my last slide. This is an example of what I have here, where with three points you can predict the solution on the right. It's not so good, as you can see, the uncertainty is big, but if I have the right-hand side with some other low-fidelity model on the right, I actually get the exact solution without totally being agnostic, knowing nothing about PDs. I will skip that. This can also be done for nonlinear equations, so we can solve basic nonlinear equations the way Poincaré wanted us to do, not the way Gauss wanted us to do. So <clears throat> let me, there are other issues about high dimensionality, technical issues. I think some of the speakers that we, uh, we have will address that. But I just want to, to <clears throat> stop here with, uh, with this triangle. We saw yesterday something uh, that one of the presenters had the slide with a physical modeling plus probabilistic learning uh, leads to, to um, inference and predictions. Here I actually have a triangle because from, from statistical learning you can infer directly the applications. But now we, what we've seen here today, and I think that's new, is that we have statistical learning interacting with scientific computing, and in fact, we construct our covariances by encoding the conservation laws directly into the kernels. That's new. In the big data community, you just infer everything. Here we have conservation laws, and we encode them into the, um, into the inference schemes. That's much more powerful, because we can predict with few data both the mean field and the, um, uh, and the uncertainty. And then we can do lots of things with data, sensitivity analysis and other things that are important for biological systems. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So while we are uh, setting up the podium for the next speaker, are there any questions, quick questions? Or? Yes. Thank you, George, for this uh, very educational uh, presentation. Um, as uh, you've mentioned, uh, dealing with different scales, you, uh, of course, uh, uh, one of the first to introduce uh, particle methods in BERT, and uh, you're also the one uh, who uh, specifically looked at the Morris-Wanzig theorem in order to uh, conserve uh, all the transfer of information while we do coarse graining. Any of the methodology here uh, is applicable uh, for that, or do you need to uh, remain in the continuum domain for that? No, <coughs> no that you, you can have also <coughs> this type of techniques for, um, for discrete methods, particle methods. In fact, there's a very nice connection between uh, Morris Wandrick that you mentioned statistical physics and, uh, and deep learning. So this memory kernel, for example, you can uh, learn it uh, using different layers of deep, deep learning. So people are starting working on that. Uh, so th that, that connection has been, there's not a lot done over, uh, yet, but people have started looking at that. <clears throat> yes, I was wondering, um, you said selecting the kernel is very important, and you chose an exponential, and I understand why. I was wondering if you uh, thought about looking at the Mid-Tag Leffler as a generalization of that which would allow you to explore solutions to uh, fractional differential equations instead of just ordinary. I, it seems like somebody paid you to do that because I, I have a Murian fractional PD. That's my baby these days. So actually, <laughs> I combine machine learning with fractional operators to learn equations. So, so, so this gives me the opportunity to talk about, so you have LU equals Seth. If you know a little bit about F, if you know a little bit about U, you can actually discover L. So if you use fractional operators, you open up the, so you can use standard operators, but the answer is, yeah, that can be done, actually, I nicely. You, you can infer that. the orders and so on from data. Thank you. So I have a question about, like, PDs uh, with, uh, on the, the domain with moving, moving boundaries. How would you, would you treat it in your kind of general concept? And also perturbations. 
Yeah, preservation is not the problem because you have you know, this Cocker fist and you can uh, separate it out from using some uh, techniques. I haven't thought about the moving domains, uh, but I could see that you can set up uh, some tracking technique, uh, level set or uh, phase field or something to, uh, to actually track that from the data. Uh, and, uh, and, and the idea here is, is actually to embed that information that you have, let's say the Cantillian equation, uh, to embed that into the kernels that you independently postulate. So that's the whole thing. We, and, and, and another thing that you, may, that you may have noticed that I didn't, I have data on F, but I don't put my priors on F, I put it on the unknown solution. So then I only solve forward problems, I don't invert anything. Uh, so now if you have discontinuities, and that goes back to the other, to the other question, uh, we don't actually use, uh, I have a different kernels. You can use a sigmoid, you can use uh, meta Leffler function that, uh, that I like. You can use all sorts of functions to uh, track the hyperbolic tangent, to track the, um, the, the moving interface. So, so, so I think it can be done, but, uh, but this is an early stage. I could see like maybe in, in the 15th anniversary, uh, meeting will have somebody will present that. Okay, I think we have to move on. We are behind the schedule. Thank you, George, again. So now our, our next speaker is Larry Karin from uh, Duke University. He is a professor at electrical engineering. At the same time, he's also vice provost for research. Very busy guy, but one of the most efficient guys that I've ne ever met, and I know him for a while now. He is also an entrepreneur. He had one company that was acquired by BAE. And uh, I don't know what else you're doing. Too many things, but uh, as I said, uh, he's doing all those things really well. And today he'll uh, talk about deep Poisson factor analysis. Um, so where do you want me to ask him to do Okay, so uh, thanks, Pedro. Um So uh, thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about uh, deep Poisson uh, factor analysis. What do, how, how do I, uh, Pedro, what, what do I do for the, uh, oh, or the wrong. Got it, thank you. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so this is the uh, agenda, this is the original agenda, but I'm gonna change it around a little bit. So, um, uh, so the, the, the methodology that we're using is uh, Poisson factor analysis, and that's because the data that we're interested in is, is uh, count data. Um, and we're going to uh, look at extending um, the uh, Poisson factor analysis to, uh, to a deep architecture, in, in this thing called a Bernoulli Poisson link. But um, what I am gonna do is skip a lot of stats and, and math, and then we'll come back to that with time allowing. And what I want to do is to, to motivate what we did and, to, and also um, to motivate the data, the problem, and then ultimately the model. And then with time, we might go back and actually talk about the model. So what we're um, interested in doing is analyzing uh, data from the electronic health record. And this was talked about earlier this morning. So the EHR represents an incredible laboratory to learn about the um, effects of various medications and procedures on, on health outcomes. And so this is, this is something that we've been focusing on. So what I'm gonna uh, talk to you about is a data set which is called the Southeast Diabetes Initiative, SETI. Um, which is a consortium of, of several uh, medical centers in the southeast uh, led by, by Duke University, where we're trying to understand uh, diabetes and trying to understand um, or predict uh, comorbidities associated with diabetes based upon the EHR alone. Uh, a part of this is that um, talking to clinicians uh, Clinicians, whenever they're doing their day-to-day -day job, they're dealing with one patient at a time, one after the other. And it is very difficult for a clinician to think at, to think at the population level, to think about how the medical care is affecting a population of people, perhaps in this case diabetes, 
and, and to learn from that population. And so that's what we're going to, so the idea is, is that this is where data science and, and mathematics could really um, provide some value because we're, we, we don't just look at things on the individual patient level, we can look at it at the population level. Okay, so this, this data set is uh, five years of EHR, 240,000 patients, 4.4 million patient visits. And um, what we're going to do is we're going to make predictions of comorbidities associated with diabetes based upon the clinical record itself. And so in that record, there are about 39,000 medications, 4,000 labs, and then these 21,000 ICD, for the doctors, they'll know what this is, the ICD-9. These are the codes that are put in uh, actually for billing purposes uh, and other purposes. So um, these are the data that we're going to try to make predictions um, with. Some of the challenges that, um, that you find when you start doing this type of work is that while there are 39,000 different medication names in the clinical record, many of those medications are very similar. And so what we um, had to do was to look at the um, 1,600 active ingredients in, in the meds, and then uh, by recognizing that many of the medications are duplicates of each other, we reduced that down to 253 different meds, um, 606 different laboratory tests, and then 4,000 or so um, diagnostic um, procedures or codes. And so that, that at the end um, is our data. And so what we're, gonna, um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna build a model that uh, looks at how an individual with diabetes interacts with the health system, and that interaction is characterized by the number of times they've been prescribed these meds, the number of times they had those laboratory tests, and the number of times they had um, diagnostic procedures. And so therefore, the data is count. It's, it's simply a count, the count of each of those things at the bottom. And um, the goal then is to answer the question, what is the risk of a given patient based upon the last 12 months that they will have um, uh, one of 13 different comorbidities associated with uh, diabetes? Okay, so this, this is um, kind of the bottom line in some sense, but we'll dig in a little bit deeper. So um, there are 13 comorbidities, there are probably more, but uh, 13 dominant comorbidities associated with diabetes. And as you know, diabetes is a very serious illness with very so serious comorbidities. So um, for, I won't read them all, but, you know, amputation, uh, heart disease, kidney disease, death, uh, et cetera. So these are obviously quite serious. Um, the UK PDS, UK is United Kingdom. Uh, PDS, I'm not exactly sure, but I guess P is probably a physician. Very good. Want to say again, please? All right, UK prospective diabetes study. And, and from that, they created a model to predict these comorbidities. And I, I don't know all the details of that model, um, but uh, in any case, it was pretty much a gold standard, uh, to my understanding. It's a very good model, a, a trusted model, it, uh, well known, apparently. <laughs> I, I never heard of it. Anyway, <laughs> so. But, but I'm glad you have. In any case, um, that model um, makes these predictions, the same types of predictions that, that we want to try to make. And so what we're showing you here is how well the UK PDS model works on the data that, that we looked at. And so these are area under curve. Everybody, I think, knows that uh, one is, uh, is, is, is the best, and 0.5 is essentially guessing. Uh, notice that. Um, the uh, axis here starts at 0.5. So if anything, we've undersold, it doesn't start at zero, right? So, um, so the, what I'm showing you here are um, three results. So the UK PDS, what we just talked about, this is um, a well-known model. Um, LASSO is, is also a, a good model. It's, it's um, probably the simplest machine learning model you could think of, simply, um, do sparse um, regression on those um, 
on those covariates right at the bottom. So there's roughly about 5,000 or so covariates. So Lasso is, is building a model based upon sparsity on those covariates. And then finally, the, um, the, the light green or yellow, whatever that is, um, that is um, our, our, our model, our, our deep um, uh, Poisson factor model. And so the um, takeaway from this is that the model works, works quite well. And the other thing is Lasso is not bad. So um, Lasso does considerably better than the UK PDF. Um, and um, it's sometimes competitive with the deep learning, but oftentimes uh, this deep Poisson model uh, does um, better. So uh, we, we will probably go back and, and talk a little bit about that model. But, um, but the bottom line here is it, it seems to work um, quite well. Now, talking um, to my clinical friends at Duke, um, they, they explained to me that building models that are predictive is nice, but if the models are not interpretable and if they are not actionable, they're not useful, or at least not as useful. And so what we would like to do is to build a model that is interpretable. And so um, that's what this model does. And so the way um, that the model basically works is um, we um, essentially build a t something called a topic model. Some of you might have heard of that topic model. It turns out that a Poisson factor model and a topic model are intimately related. And um, a topic model is characterized in terms of topics where the topics are prevalence of these, say, 5,000 covariates. So topic models were originally developed for documents. A topic is characterized by a set of words that tend to be present together. And so um, we can think of a topic model for medical EHR data where we would expect that certain meds, certain laboratory tests, and certain diagnoses would be um, prevalent together for certain types of topics. So this is why it's called a topic model. Okay, so what are the topics we learn? And this is now where the interpretability comes in. So to, do, to get these um, results that I'm showing you here, we effectively build a classifier based upon the prevalence of topics for a given individual, a given patient. And so the question then is, if we're building a model for prediction of an amputation, so the, the, the question that we're trying to ask is to identify patients who, based upon the clinical record over the last 12, ma uh, 12 months, are likely to be uh, in need of an amputation in the next six months. And um, so this is, um, um, this is what the model gives us. So they're, they're roughly about three, uh, well, I guess about 400, 400 topics. So let me, again, um, try to explain what a topic is. So we have 5,000 or so uh, covariants, meds, lab tests, diagnosis, procedures. And the data is counts of those. And then a topic is a collection of a, a subset of meds, labs, and codes that tend to be together and are um, implicitly characteristic of some latent health situation or disease situation in um, a given patient. And so when we build the predictive model, we, we can look at we can, the, the predictive model, so the, the, what we're trying to do here is predict whether an individual is, going to have, is in need of an amputation in the next six months. That predictive model is manifested by the degree, the degree to which each of those 400 topics is manifested in the patient. So saying it again, every topic is a latent characteristic of health. Based upon the data from a given patient, we can quantify the degree to which the topics are manifested in that individual, and then we can build a classifier based upon those topic prevalence to predict amputation. 
So it turns out that when we look at what I'm showing you here on this top figure is the, prep, the, the importance of each of those 400 topics for prediction of amputation. And so topic 126, so 126 in the med category, topic 7 in the lab category, and topic 67 in the, in the code category are the dominant, the dominant um, uh, uh, topics that are predictive of amputation. So what, what are the um, meds, what are the labs, and what are the codes that are indicative of a, of, a, of a pending amputation, and I, I list them there. So for the clinicians in the room, I'm sure these mean a lot to you. Um, of course, I've shown this to my clinical friends, and um, you know they're they're quite happy with them. Um, so you can you can just glance at that. So so this is so what this is doing is out of the 5,000 or so covariates in the clinical record, these are identifying those covariates from the med lab and code um, category that are most predictive of, of a pending amputation. Now, another thing that the model um, can do is to learn the network structure characteristic of the correlation between the meds. And so what, that, what I mean by that is, is that um, the, if a given individual is taking med A, then they are likely or not likely to be taking med B because of the underlying characteristics of health and, and also the underlying characteristics of, um, of, of, the, of the medications themselves. So I don't, of course, expect you to read this. I'm going to zoom in in a second. But um, what this is showing us is a network in the, uh, about the interrelationships between the drugs that are being prescribed at the, at the, at the medical center. And as you know, as you, I'm sure you know if you read the news, um, the over-prescription of drugs, particularly opiates, is a, a very, very serious issue in, in the United States today. So this, this is actually quite an important problem. So um, we can then zoom in to that network and see sets of meds which are correlated with each other and actually form a family of correlated local network of drugs. And it turns out, so of course, um, I go to my MD friend, and I show them this, and they look at it, and, and they're actually quite happy with it. And I'm only showing you one example. We, of course, have looked at this entire, we've looked at this entire geography very carefully. Um, but this is just one example. So this is um, what the doctors call an asthma group. This is a collection of drugs that um, are interrelated and are typically given to people with um, asthma. Okay, so um, as I mentioned to you, the predictive model is predicting, the prov predicting whether a given patient is going to have each of these 13 comorbidities associated with diabetes based upon the degree to which topics are manifested in the data. And um, topics, again, are... Um, meds, codes, labs that tend to come that correlated and, again, are associated with some latent health uh, situation. And so um, we can go and study those. And so this is um, a meta topic that um, the doctors, so I, I don't label, the, the model just does its thing and then it, it, it learns topics. I then go to the doctors and show, and show them um, what we have learned and you know, ask them, is it useful, is it, uh, does it seem right? And um, it, it, to them it seems both useful and right. Um, but um, this is um, what they call the prostate cancer metatopic. And so um, what you're seeing here are um, categories of, of meds pro uh, and, and those other covariates that I showed you that are characteristic um, of uh, prostate cancer. How much time I got? All right, one and a half minutes. So we have zero equation talk. How do you like that? Um, this is uh, another one. This is associated with um, depressive disorder, chronic pain. So um, now let me summarize my talk. And I, I, I got one of the bullets. 
But um, I, I did that on purpose. I, I, I know that this is not entirely a technical audience, so I, I, I did that on purpose. So, um, so we could talk offline. We, we have published this for, so for the technical people who want to read about the details. We, we published a paper at NIPS and in JMLR on this. Um, so, um, but what we have done is developed a deep Poisson factor model, which is not unlike the deep Gaussian process model that was talked about in the previous talk. That the deep architecture, so what does the depth give us? So what it, it plays many roles, but the deep arc, ooh, okay, that wasn't good. The deep architecture, I want to, all right, the deep architecture allows us to learn this, um, this network structure. It allows us to learn the, the, the correlation and covariance structure. That actually is much of what the deep architecture is doing. Um, we have done extensive tests of this and continue to do um, tests of it. The um, performance of the model is, um, is actually quite good. It's considerably better than UK PDS and is also better than a very competitive machine learning method lasso. Um, we currently at Duke, so this is a five-year database that I told you. We now have a 10-year database, so we're going to um, uh, continue this work and, and ultimately try to test it in our, in our health system. Thank you for your attention. To move on, we don't have time for questions now. We'll we'll do it during the uh, panel discussion. So uh, our next speaker is Elhanan Mosel. He's a professor of mathematics at MIT. And uh, I don't. Oh, you're there. Okay, great. And um, and his uh, area of he's covering uh, combinatorics, probability, inference, and many other. And he's. Uh, Minimalist, he always gives very simple, elegant, beautiful talks and very intriguing. So I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you very much for the no, no pressure introduction. And uh, so I, I really don't know this audience. I've never been to NIH before, so I decided to give a very high level talk. Many of you must have, must have thought about some of the issues that I'm going to bring before, but at the very least, it might be a good warm up for the panel that we're going to talk about. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about, I have a side of myself that proves theorems. That's what I, I'm getting paid for, so proving theorems. I know that some of you are not interested in proving theorems. I also have an applied side. I was involved in a personalized medicine startup. I looked at pedigree. I you know, diagnosed their diseases. And I have these issues that the two parts of my brain want to talk to each other and you know, try to understand what's going on. And I'll give you a, a bunch of little examples where this happened and maybe some trivial or not so trivial thought about, about what I learned. And it's going to be very non-technical. So I'm going to start from a point that many of you are aware of. This is the, the way we statisticians, the statisticians who are more critical like to, like to think about it. So all models are bad, right? So we all know that models are bad. They are not really a good representation of reality. And you know, one, one statement that's, that's uh, common in the statistic, statistic uh, literature for the people who think about these issues is that some models are useful, and we don't really have a good characterization of which models are useful or not, and I don't claim to have one, but I want to give a few examples where maybe you can get you know, some of the characteristics that lead us to, to believe that some models are good and some models are not good, so uh, let's try to do that. So it's something that happened to me around the year, uh, around the year 2003 or 2004, this has nothing to do with NIH, but uh, there was this guy whose name is David X. Lee, and you know, if you are bored on my talk, you can look him up in Google right now on your laptop. And if you look him up, he apparently is a mathematical genius who invented a new way to compute risk in Wall Street, and the Wall Street people really liked it. Why did they really like it? Well, they liked it for various reasons. One reason they really liked it, it was very easy to compute. So they could compute risk. They could hire uh, not necessarily brightest PhD students or people who didn't necessarily finish their PhD, and they could tell them, listen, why did you calculate the risk on this derivative? You know, there's this formula now and we can calculate it. So what's entertaining for me about this is I actually work in this area for at least 20 years. And I remember a visit to Sweden with uh, Christel Borrell, who is one of the leading experts in this area, 
And he told me in 2003 and 2004, you know, he said something like, you know, these clowns in Wall Street actually use this to estimate risk. So I was thinking he was joking. We were both joking. He said, no, you can't really mean that. This is such a terrible model. How do they do that? You know, we have a bunch of mathematical experts. Is that any of them? And these are some papers and some books. And, you know, there's a big community of people who do exactly that. We do it for at least 50 years. We know that this is a terrible model. But these mathematical geniuses and others decided to ignore it. Okay, so what's the lesson from this story? So for me, the lesson here is that you should not use math that you don't understand, or at the very least, you should be very, be very careful about using math that you do not understand. Okay, so this is definitely what happened in Wall Street. I mean, it's not just 20 people who understand this math, there's probably hundreds or thousands of people who understand this math. Wall Street had their own reasons to ignore the advice of some of the people and not to seek the advice of other people and use math that he did not understand, and we all know, you know, that this played a role in, in, in what happened in the, in, in the Wall Street collapse market. Okay, so that, that's one example, you know, if you use math that you don't understand, go and talk to your math friend in your, in your, uh, in your campus and ask them, is this math that's reasonable to use, and listen to what, what they are saying. There's another, now I'm going to tell you another story. There are going to be some positive stories too, hopefully, if there's time, but there's another negative story. I'm also a mathematician, so I'm a pessimist. I don't believe anything. So here's something that's come up from my own work. So around 2003, a very brilliant, actually very good taste, very good modeling capability, John Kleinberg, Eva Sardos, and David Camper came up for a model of how people influence other people in social networks. So this has to do like it's called viral marketing. It's the analog of, of virus spread, or actually a model of virus spread on, on social networks. And I love this model, and I worked on it. And the reason I love this model and I worked on it, it's a beautiful, beautiful model. You know, you can, it's really an elegant model. You can prove, I like to prove stuff, so you can prove amazing results that are optimal. You can design algorithms that you can also show that are optimal. You can publish papers that are accepted to good places, and you're very happy. Okay, so that was my experience. So then, a few years later, I actually went and consulted for some company that does this stuff. Okay, so that's what the company was doing. This company was trying to say, well, we are trying to maintain cell phone customers. We don't want them to leave. But when cell phone customers leave our network, sometimes other people will follow him, so we want to understand how, what's the value of these customers to us. How much should we bribe them or incentivize them in order to stay in our network? And let's use your brilliant models in order to predict the effect of removing this guy from the network. So I really wanted this model to work. It doesn't work. If you twist it around, if you change it, if you make it more flexible, if you want, whatever you do, it actually is a very bad model. So that's the other danger, that if you come from the side of the theory and you say, okay, here's, here's a very elegant model of what's happening in practice, then, you know, sometimes you end up in a situation where, where you're not in a very good state. Okay, so beautiful models are not enough, AI as expertise is needed. So you all probably all know that, but maybe at least you find the stories entertaining. Something that's maybe a closer to the topics of discussions here is, is uh, related to Bayesian modeling. So uh, we had, we had uh, in, in uh, the presentation, the, the initial presentation this morning, we were talking about the question, why did Bayesian inference didn't take over everything? And I think one of the reasons that Bayesian inference didn't take over, over the world is that it's very easy to make the wrong assumption and be convinced that you're correct. Okay, so that's something that you can actually prove. And uh, it happens in the uh, setup of phylogenetic mixtures. So phylog phylog phylogenies, many of you know, are used to, to infer uh, evolutionary history. It could be pieces of mammals, it could be viruses, it could be bacteria in some situations, and so on and so forth. And, you know, in the result, maybe almost 10 years ago, what we, what we showed is that there are many situations where the following could happen, again, at a very high level. You come up with a Bayesian model, you run your Bayesian analysis, you get an answer, and what's nice about Bayesian analysis, in Bayesian analysis, you always get a p-value or some confidence or some posterior, but even though you, 
use the model that seems reasonable, and even though your p-value might be very, very close to one, or your posterior might be very, very, uh, seem to be very, very accurate, then the model that you infer is completely wrong. Okay, so this could happen. So there are some sensitivity issues of Bayesian models that make the modeling assumptions much more crucial than you might have thought. Okay, so people say, oh, I'm going to make a, a modeling assumption, but then, you know, if my modeling assumption is a little bit bad, maybe it's not so bad because at the end I'm going to get a posterior and the posterior is going to tell me how wrong I was. This is incorrect. If your specification of the model is off, even if the model is reasonable, you might get a result that's completely off and you'll have a confidence value that's very close to 100%. Okay, so this is in the setup for a phylogenetic mixture. It happens in many other situations. That's an issue in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Bayesian modeling. And I think the conclusion from that for people who actually want to use Bayesian modeling is don't let your Bayesian statistician friends do the modeling for you. You actually have to look at the details of the Bayesian modeling and make sure it makes sense. Because if you don't do that, then you may end up with brilliant results which will tell you everything is perfect, but it's wrong. Question? I think some, I, yeah, so, so that, that's, that's a very good question. I mean, so to some extent, the question was the following, isn't it true for any model? Okay, and I think it is true for every family, reasonable family of models that you, you think about, but I think it is more true in the Bayesian setup because the Bayesian setup always gives, gives you a posterior, a posterior number, while in other situations you don't necessarily get a posterior value. Right? It, depends, it depends on your model. But we can talk about that later. Let's not have this discussion right now, okay? But I'm happy to have this for a discussion later. I mean, it's, it's, I agree, it's, it's a generic phenomenon. I think it's easier to get into this stuff in, in the Bayesian setup. Okay, some success stories. Uh, I don't know how much many of you care about uh, inferring phylogeny. If you do, as your left hand, three people care about inferring phylogeny, so we don't care. So we know how to infer phylogeny very well. How, do, how can we know how to infer phylogeny very well? So what do I say by we know? So by we know, I mean the models are good. We have theorems that say how much information do you need in order to infer phylogeny in what accuracy is. We have algorithms that are efficient and can infer these phylogenies in this way. And there's a big story here that, you know, somehow inter there's some interplay between many areas starting in the 70s, between people in biology and in statistics that came up with this model, people who developed phylogenetic software, people in physics who studied related models, and so on and so forth. This is just a cartoon of a picture of, you know, the information theory perspective of this model. It's a model where, you know, the information goes from the root of the phylogenetic trees to the boundary, and then you have to do some inference, it's just a cartoon, but we understand this information theory or statistical physics perspective, also some version of an easing model, we understand this perspective very well, and there's a lot of work that gives us very, very accurate answers, including to the following question, you know, which I think is relevant in the context of what you talked about, we have theories which says, in these situations, you cannot recover phylogenetic trees. Okay, it's, not a, it's not a question of the method, there's some information theory limitations that tells you that if the phylogeny is too deep or too sparse in a way that we can quantify, then you cannot infer phylogeny in a reasonable way. And the, the last story, I, the last story I'm going to tell you is, is for me maybe the most uh, entertaining because I don't really understand what's going on here. So. In 2011, a bunch of physicists friends got me into this work on the block model, which I really liked because it's a beautiful mathematical model. It has beautiful connections to statistical physics. And I didn't care to work about it because it's clearly a terrible model. Okay, so it's a terrible model. You know, I'm a mathematician, you know, it's a terrible model. Nobody is going to bother me with applications of this model because it's terrible. I can do my math. I can prove my convergence in the weak limit to infinite graph, compute the phase transition, do all the things that I really enjoy and you don't care about. So this physicist has a, a, a very nice theory, which with other people uh, we, we confirmed, and we found also algorithms that, that work for that. And what was interesting with working with the physicist afterwards is 
we actually run the algorithms that we found for this really, really terrible model on real data, and they worked well. And I didn't really expect it, because the model is terrible. My physicist friends know it's terrible. Every reasonable statistician knows it's terrible. Everybody knows it's a terrible model. But then, you know, you develop good algorithms for this very, very terrible model, and it still works well. And I think what's happening here is something that, in fact, it's not a new phenomenon. It's something that you're all aware of. If you have a very simple model that has, has very, very few parameters, then even though it's a terrible approximation, sometimes it's a useful approximation. Okay, so that's an odd lesson from statistics that, you know, maybe I started by saying that all models are bad, but some are useful. Many of you use regression. Linear models are terrible. Nothing is linear in anything that you do, but linear models are simple. And because linear models are simple, they're sometimes useful even though they're terrible. So the similar phenomena happened with the block model. I'll just show you some picture with the joint work with the physicist. I mean, you probably won't be able to see, but you know, there's some interesting phenomena here that we developed a new algorithm, which is a spectral algorithm, but it's a spectral algorithm for a non-symmetric or a non-Hermitian matrix. So the eigenvalues are actually complex. And you know, so again, it sounds like very interesting mathematical theory, complex eigenvalue, but why would this give you information? And then when you actually run them away on, on actual networks, you see that the real eigenvalues correspond to communities. And the complex eigenvalues do not correspond to communities. And you, you know, it's the theory that is that. And then you run it in practice. And you see, oh, in this example that somebody labeled, there are nine non-complex eigenvalues. And there are exactly nine communities. And we wouldn't expect it. And this happens. Right? So I don't claim that we understand why this happens in the generality that it happens. But maybe one reason that this happens is that the model is simple enough that there's some gen general power in the model. Okay, so I had no slides. I don't know what happened to them. I think maybe I don't have the latest version of the of the of the uh, PDF on the on the on the screen. So actually, Peja asked me to 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 include some technical content, which I did at some version of the talk, which is not here. Uh, but if you want to catch me with some technical questions uh, after the after the break or after the panel discussion, so. One thing I want to tell you, there's no whiteboard too. So one thing I want to tell you, usually when you think about representing a graph, you're thinking about representing it as a matrix. There's another way of representing it as a, representing it as a matrix, which is called this non-backtracking walks. So look for this non-backtracking walks on Google or ask me what it is. This gives you this very, very strange non-symmetric matrices that have this complex spectrum it seems to be very, very useful in cases, in many cases where you have sparse networks. So that's one technical thing I wanted to tell you. If you're interested in uh, recovering uh, phylogenetic trees or pedigrees, also come and talk to me. And uh, I guess I finished ahead of time, so I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Wonderful. So, uh, so we can have a panel discussion right now. Um, so I'd like to invite. Uh, speakers, George and Larry, and, uh, and I know there were some questions. So you might have noticed that, uh, that uh, despite the fact that deep learning is uh, ruling these days, we don't have speakers that are describing deep learning necessarily, because uh, one of the reasons is because it's a black box really model. And we would like to know why the, the system is predicting su su something with confidence and why it's making errors. And with deep learning, it's just impossible to do that. So we are more interested in, in opening that black box. And that's one of the comments that Larry had. Um, so if, uh, if you guys have a question, go ahead, please. So I'm, I have a question for the last speaker. And I'm just about to head home. I'm going to have to face my kid, and I'm going to have to face my kids with a phylogeny question. So, so I'd like to pose it to you. So as you know, on Monday, we just moved the theropods from, from one clade to another. Uh, so they, they're, they're, they're now, they're now, they're now are, are more like Stegosaurus than like Brontosaurus. And what, what is it that prevents the tools, the complex tools that you're using from taking, from taking a, very, a very large set of of uh, information we have on something like 
uh, on something like dinosaurs. We have all of this morphometric information. What, 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 what prevents tools like, such as a backtracking walk from just taking the entire set of morphometric information we have and, and popping out uh, a, a phylogeny that's not going to change on my kid? I, I, sorry, I think definitely part of the issue is that uh, evolutionary models do change. Evolutionary data does change. So even though I was trying to present it as, you know, this is a, you know, the story is complete, we have models, we know how to infer them, and so on and so forth, there's this, these things do evolve dynamically, especially when it comes to species that are either very close together or very far apart. I think the sort of classical uh, phylogenetic models are pretty good in the situation that's in between, things that are species that are not too far and not too close. And then, you know, I think even the old classical models are pretty good and predictions haven't changed much. But if you talk about other species that are very, very far apart or very, very close together, you know, often there are issues and, you know, the models using different models or slightly different data can change the outcomes. And I should also say, you know, there's just biological processes like, you know, radiation, where, you know, there's a lot of bifurcation in the phylogeny that happens in a very short time that we know theoretically are hard to infer. So I don't know exactly what was the story with the dinosaurs, but this could have definitely been something like that that also played a role. There's a question for Larry. Uh, drugs are tested usually one at a time in a very controlled population in a clinical trial. And you've got this very large heterogeneous population with polypharmacy. Do you see the signature of drug effectiveness or drug efficacy for a single drug in this complex, you know, population? So, um, so we think we can. So, um, uh, so, it's a, so um, it's a very good question. So I can't give you a definitive answer. But what I can tell you is. Um, uh, the, the clinical trials are very, very expensive, and um, uh, um, and, and moreover, even the outcomes of a clinical trial, retrospectively, actually are not even true. I mean, there are drugs on the market that are known not, not to be effective for what they were said to be effective for, but they're still being prescribed. This is well known. And so, um, uh, um, interestingly, um, well, whatever. Well, interestingly, the uh, former director of the FDA is a, is, a, is a Rob Califf, who is at Duke, and, and uh, so um, uh, so we we're, we um, we we want to answer that question. It would it would you know it's a very big question because it would change the way, in some sense, drugs you know are, are looked at. So um, I'm just a statistician, right? So, but. Um, but the, the thing is, is that we, we think that um, the medical record, the EHR, uh, is an incredible laboratory to learn about health and drug efficacy, um, and, and, and that's what we intend to do. Um, it asks some very hard questions, though. You know, that, that you, you will get to some very hard um, outcomes, like um, how effective are drugs really? Um, are all doctors equally effective, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are questions that can be answered, or, you know, and there's going to be, those are going to be difficult questions, difficult, difficult answers. But um, uh, um, the, the, um, one of the things that's happened over the last uh, 10 or so years is that the prevalence of EHRs is, is now uh, almost everybody has them. So it's an opportunity to learn that we didn't have before. The last talk we had all models are bad. I don't think everybody in the room has probably heard that before. But I just want to remind everybody that's all we have. Everything we have is a model. That wet lab that's implanting tumors into a mouse is a model. And it has the same problems that any computational model has. That clinical trial is a model and has the same problems any of any computational model has. So what I wanted to ask is any work towards doing a Bayesian analysis where you take into account that your rat model might not be predictive of humans? And that's a prior uncertainty that says this huge, wonderful model that you just built 
that's going to be used to justify a $100 million clinical trial has some uncertainty because the animal model it's based on, where all the wet lab came from that you built your computational model, is fundamentally unreliable or has some degree of unreliability. So, um, so, so David Dunson is going to talk us in the next session, so I'll let David pick that up in the next session. But, but I will say, relative to your point, one thing that I learned from Rob Caleb is that over 90% of clinical trials that are based upon uh, uh, animal models fail, over 90%. Yeah, but all clinical trials are based on animal models. No, exactly, exactly. So <laughs> the point is over 90% of clinical trials fail. Yeah, yeah, I realize And, and, and so, so where, how do you do a Bayesian analysis on that, the wet lab biology that you're basing your clinical trial decision on? Like in, in my approach, I would, uh, I would follow a multi-fidelity, I, I would use some human data and uh, lots of animal studies and maybe some other in vitro experiments to infer what studies actually to design. So I had proposed that to a vaccine company and, and you know, that's what, that's, that's what you want to do. So uh, just having one population, just animals trying to extrapolate, that's very dangerous. And, uh, and um, like um, we heard before, uh, yes, the Bayesian approach always gives you an answer um, and, but I, but actually it's a very robust approach, I would say, especially for the mean. I think you can uh, overestimate easily the variance, and in many cases, of course, you can always choose the wrong prior and everything is wrong, but, but uh, the, the, the mean field that you predict is uh, sometimes it's quite robust, especially of the data that you're using. So we should not be so pessimistic. I'm actually very optimistic because I, I compute, and I know I get good results. One question from the wiki, and I'm going to read that question. I don't know how to turn the mic off. On. Can you turn the mic on? Oh, oh, I think it works now. Okay. So that's a question for uh, Larry. The naive question is, uh, yeah, that the question is over there. Uh, is the context of the words, uh, the context is, is, is important, really, and you're using, you're counting words, right? So what, what happens if you use semantics basically there and have richer features. And basically you're using bigger words, I assume, right? Something like that in your features. Okay, so, so just to be clear, I think everybody understands, but to be clear, my words, words, are lab, yeah. um, med, and code, right? So I'm not, do, I'm not doing NLP, in, in, but um, it, is, uh, it is a bag of word model, which means it doesn't matter on the, how we got to a count, it, it just counts. But um, I didn't, of course, show any equations, but the, 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 the really nice thing about the deep learning is, is that it learns the correlation structure between all those things. And, and that was what that network was giving us. So, um, so while it is a bag of word model, that does not mean that, um, that it doesn't account for a correlation and dependency between between those words, and loosely speaking, but um, and and that's what that network is 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 um, about. And you know, relative to that other question, so you know, you learn a network of, of drugs, and um, and and we've just started to try to understand that. But there might be um, information there about effectiveness of the drug. You know, some of those drugs in the network may be more effective than others. But um, in any case, it, it is um, the, the correlation structure is, is learned through the data. Okay, another question is when increasing the depth of your model, are you able to interpret the model? Is the depth helping you with interpretation? Yeah, so the depth, I, I didn't get to talk about that, but that actually is really, I think, really quite interesting. So in a, in a traditional topic model, which is just a single layer topic model, every topic is a distribution of words. Um, it is, it, and it's reflective of the, pre the presence of a, a certain set of words for that topic. When you go to the second layer, the vocabulary is topics. So now you're, you have distribution of topics. So, um, so as I said, you know, you might have different um, topics that are characteristic of some latent health process. And then the second layer of the deep architecture learns correlation structure between those. And then the third layer learns correlation structure on correlation structure. And so, um, 
so the depth of the model is in fact what is key to learning that correlation structure. So it's actually quite important. Okay, final question. Uh, how do you find the background in your learning? The data, back, uh, negative data examples in your learning. And, uh, and are there, are there any different uh, choices of negative data affect your performance? So, so the data, the data that we're looking at is counts of um, those covariates over the last 12 months. So it's so the data for any given patient is very very sparse, mostly zero, um, and and then a few then a few counts. So there's not there's nothing negative. I'm not sure exactly. Positive examples and negative examples. Oh oh oh. Um, actually, the the model I should have said this. The or maybe I should have emphasized it. Um, the deep model. So this is a deep generative model. It's a deep generative model, and so in fact it can be entirely can be entirely um, unsupervised. The, the building of the classifier, you know, amputation and whatnot, it can be done almost separately in some sense. Um, but I will, okay, so, so that just fits to the model. But I, I will, let me talk a little bit. This, this might get to the question a little bit. So what, how did we do this experiment? I mean, how did we do this study? Um, so diabetes, like let's study diabetes. Let, let's study diabetes. What's the definition of diabetes? You can find seven or eight different definitions of diabetes. And um, so we actually had a team of uh, nurses and doctors who were helping us with that. Another question which is related to that is, um, remember one of my, out well, we had 13 comorbidities. Um, if somebody were to have died outside of the Duke Health System or would have had an amputation outside of the Duke Health System, um, we don't capture that. So, so in fact, the data itself is, is uh, very noisy, um, very contradictory, which, you know, Pedro, you know, from the Navy perspective, I mean, it's got many of the characteristics of what, what the DOD cares about. It's noisy, it's incomplete, it's, it's contradictory, et cetera. So, um, so those things are all in there. Um, so, so in fact, when we predict an amputation, and we validate that we got it right, that, we, that somebody did not get an amputation in the Duke Health System did not mean that they didn't get an amputation. And that they didn't die. We actually, on our team, had people who searched um, death records. We had like the death record person. And um, we had to search across the country to find out whether people died. So there's a tremendous amount of work that goes into a project like that um, to try to make um, the data as, um, because the, the first speaker this morning, she, she used a word that's um, very important, curator, data curator. Um, that's really, really important. And, and so on our, on our SETI team, we had, up, I think, close to 10 people who were data curators. And these are very, very important people. Um, you know, this is how you can get very, um, you can get very confident models that are wrong um, for maybe different reasons. <laughs> But the data itself has issues. So um, you had mentioned uh, when you first brought the panel up the uh, difficulty with interpreting sort of the, the hidden layers, for instance, within deep learning network, and the idea that deep learning networks can, can discover patterns but may not give you structural explanations. Um, and while I tend to agree with that, I might want to take what may be or I would consider the devil's advocate point of view and say that nevertheless there may be some value to pattern discovery, even in the absence of explanation. And this is, one could argue, the Gaussian processes are a model of this. One could argue that lots of standard statistics factor analysis is also an example of this, where you try to find patterns without worrying quite so much about where they come from. Um, but I think here, in this consortium, when we're thinking about multi-scale models, we're often thinking about very specific causative models that are intended to, in some way, mimic the structure of the, of the biology. And, and so what I wanted to sort of throw out there is, what is the use of these pattern discovery type models or statistical methods for the creation of this type of multi-scale models or the type of uh, sort of causative structural models uh, that, that might be more familiar in, in the, uh, uh, the biology world? 
Yeah, I think this is an excellent question. I, I think some of us are think, I'm thinking about it. I think other people are thinking about it. I, I, I mean, there are definitely the kind of definitely the kind of models that I was talking about, the evolutionary models. Right? A pedigree is a deep net. Right? So what happens if you want a standard deep net algorithm on a pedigree? The interpretation should be the people. So can we read the people out of the pedigree and so on and so forth? So I think some people are thinking about it. I think this is an excellent question. I think the Google and Facebook, pe Facebook people say there's no interpretation, and I think we should, in our the kind of biological models, uh, the hierarchy actually means something. You know, we should find what this thing is. So, so, so you know, the models, the, um, the the deep architectures, they they do allow us to learn. You know, that learn patterns and in, in correlations and structures, and and it, it really is data driven. So, um, so it's it's absolutely there. But um, when you are talking to a clinician, which you know, um, well, when you're talking to a clinician, and you're telling them to change the way they deliver care, they're going to want to understand what it was that drove that. And and the other thing is is that the data with which we learn, like the the study, you know, the, that thing, the EHR that we looked at, is very noisy. If, if a person were to leave, they, they get sick when they're in, in South Carolina and they go to a local hospital, we don't get that, right? Um, they, somebody gets amputation elsewhere. So, so the point is, is that when we make inferences and we, and we build models, we have, to, we have to look at what they're saying. We may discover things. I mean, we may discover things that we didn't know, but it has to be defendable because um, because there may be stuff that you learn that is just simply wrong. And it's not because your model's wrong, it's because the data that drove it is wrong. The other thing that, you know, that I haven't said, we haven't said, is um, you know, the doctors know a lot about medicine. So like when I talk to these guys, they, like, they're not interested in me telling them stuff they already know. That, you know they, they're interested in new things. And so a lot of what we learn, a lot of what the model learns, they know. So it's nice. It's kind of re it's mostly reassuring, but it's it's not advancing medicine because they know that already. So so your point is quite right. It's to discover the things they don't know, but also to be able to defend them. Quick uh, point regarding big data that we are dealing with now. It turns out that it's uh, it's not that difficult to find patterns in big data. You just have to be persistent, and you'll find it. And with some confidence, really. Um, and the other thing is uh, that's this caution about you know finding patterns in big data. You'll find them. Uh, the other thing is uh, the problem with deep deep networks. They they discover some patterns. That's fine. Correlations. But when they make a mistake, uh, we have no clue why they make those mistakes. And that's dangerous, really. So sometimes those patterns can be useful. Sometimes they're not. And we have to figure out when. Make a point about this because uh, it's different in the physical models. So, for example, in these uh, uh, models where you have no any conservation or any constraints, uh, it's very dangerous to extrapolate. But the models I was talking about, where you mix actually some conservation principles, some constraints, uh, then you inform the covariance, then you can actually extrapolate from that. And that's where the robustness would come in, in this combination. Uh, and, and also that will be more immune to noise, for example. We have 30 seconds left, and last question. So, uh, I, I too wanted to ask about big data versus uh, what I would call real sort of physiologic type models. And the question is, uh, it seems pretty clear that the models that are always wrong, I mean blatantly wrong, are the big data models. And the model the models that really drive us forward in terms of understanding detailed mechanisms tend to be the physiology models. So what is it that the big data guys can learn from the physiology models? There must be a way to make the models better. And one of the issues uh, which you know I, I heard just said was that it's not the model that's wrong, it's the way the data implemented to drive the model. Maybe that's not right. Maybe, you know, they're, they're both wrong. So, anyway, that, just a question. 
I think famous, uh, as a famous quote, all models are wrong, right? All, some are useful. Well, we're always wrong all the time in the long run. Everything is wrong in the long run. No, but you know, so listen, you're, you're asking a very good question, but I, I'll tell you what we do at Duke, okay? Just uh, what we do. Um, we run clinical trials. So we, we, we build a model that says, and, and we literally do this. So we use data science on big data and we, and we say, uh, this is a good, this, the model says this is a good thing to do. But we don't trust the model. We run a clinical trial, randomized clinical trial, and, and we test it. So we don't believe anything. We don't believe the model, we don't believe the data. Prove it. And, um, and, and, and we've had some success. We, we, we've um, looked at data from the EHR, uh, made predictions of it that were not obvious. That's another thing. They have to be, be non-obvious to a doctor and they have to be actionable. And then, um, uh, and, and um, these are sometimes very basic things that whether people take their meds. I mean, a lot, just whether people take their meds. And um, so another data set that we're looking at is not the EHR, it's the uh, medical claims data, which is a different data. So that, that's the insurance data. And so that's actually better than, in some sense, because the doctor can pre prescribe meds, but that doesn't mean the patient's taking the meds. Um, if you look at the medical claims data, at least um, you know they're filling the meds. And so we, we built models to try to understand this, and then we, we, we learned that if we did X, um, we would expect better outcomes. We then did a clinical trial where we tried to make X happen and, and, and are seeing some positive results. So what I would say is don't believe anything. Don't believe the data. Don't believe the model. Don't believe anything. Prove it through clinical trials. I just want to follow up on that because I don't subscribe to the quote that all models are wrong. Uh, and usually people come to me and say, okay, you work on all these methods. Which one is better? I say that there's no bad methods. They're bad users. So that's kind of, uh, I think, just saying that all models are wrong, it's kind of a some simplified, and I don't subscribe to that. Okay, uh, let's uh, finish this note, and let's thank our speakers. And we'll have a little shorter break, I think about 20 minutes shorter. So we'll break for refreshments upstairs um, and posters. Uh, please post your scales and methods on the poster table. I see there are still some blanks there. This is uh, exactly why we need this poster table to see what methods, what new methods you're developing. So we'll reconvene here at 1030. Thank you. The next talk will be by David Danson, who is a professor of um, statistics at Duke University. Um, he is one of the best people in the area of Bayesian statistics probably in the world. And it's a pleasure to have him here. And, uh, and one of the great things about David is that he's able to explain very complex uh, models in very, very simple terms. So please uh, welcome David Johnson. Thanks a lot for the invitation. So, so my goal today really wasn't to like highlight my own research, but really to kind of try to bridge between two communities. And so, um, in particular, uh, applied math, mechanistic modeling, biomass modeling of systems, um, and, and type of Bayesian statistical and machine learning approaches. Okay. So um, with that in mind, I was going to just kind of provide a really brief reminder to some of you who aren't familiar with, with Bayesian methods so much, but what the Bayesian paradigm is doing, um, talk a little bit about Bayesian uncertainty quantification and physical modeling or mechanistic modeling, um, and then I'll, I'll wrap up with a type of ongoing research direction, which you could call like me mechanistic Bayesian modeling, you know, kind of bridging between differential equation or PD modeling and, and things like Gaussian process modeling or non-thermetric. Okay, so just a kind of generic setup, the Bayesian land, let's say we have some sort of parameters, the theta, which are unknown inputs, and we have some likelihood function um, of the data, y, given, given the parameters, and, and this might not necessarily be tractable, of course, in a, in a mechanistic modeling context. Um, and then, so Bayesian inference is going to start with some prior probability distribution, say pi of theta on the unknowns. Um, the probability qu quantifies our uncertainty, 
in these unknowns prior to observing data Y. It can include, you know, known structural con constraints. Uh, theta can be pretty complicated potentially. It can be some unknown function. It could be a big table. It could be shapes of, of, of bi biologic objects. It can be anything. Okay, and then, so then the, the usual Bayesian paradigm then defines a posterior distribution. And so we have um, pi of theta given y. That's our current state of knowledge about theta, quantify our, our uncertainty in that given data y. And that's going to be equal to the prior probability um, times the likelihood of the data given that parameter and then divided by this uh, normalizing constant, which is, is known as the marginal likelihood, which is the likelihood of the data given the parameters uh, marginalized over the prior distribution. And that integral, an interestingly complicated model, multi-scale mechanistic models, would potentially be quite high dimensional, and that might be an intractable interval. Okay. Okay, and so then we have this wonderful thing, pi of theta given y, which unlike, you know, deter just fitting something and just getting some point estimates, it's quantifying our uncertainty about theta given y you know, and, and information in our mechanistic model and likelihood. Okay, so this is my point that the, the theta can be very broad. It's not just like a scale or a matrix. It can be a function, a surface, a tensor, latent data, et cetera. Um, outside of simple conjugate families, you don't have this posterior and analytic form, but there's a, a really rich literature on computational algorithms for doing things like sampling from the posterior distribution from which you can get, you know, statistical estimators of any functional of the parameters of interest. You can get something like a confidence interval, et cetera. Okay. And so the main, the main thing that people tend to use is known as Markov chain Monte Carlo. So you, you construct a Markov chain where you're iteratively sampling um, theta and the stationary distribution of that Markov chain is pi of theta given y. Um, and the cool thing about Markov chain Monte Carlo is it bypasses uh, ever needing to calculate this intractable normalizing constant L of Y, which involves some sort of high dimensional integral. Okay, so what, how is this useful in, in mechanistic modeling of biologic systems? In such settings, you might have some intricate system of equations, ODEs, SDs, PDs, et cetera. So how do, how do, we, how do we kind of marry these two things? Well, you could imagine that Maybe we can't write down a likelihood function exactly, but we could certainly maybe forward simulate from our model. And so if we had known input, we could simulate data from our, our, our mechanistic model. That's the point. And so then maybe we can kind of create a likelihood that way. Um, also, there's commonly, what you commonly do is to supply some sort of solver to kind of fit the data. You fit your PDE or whatever um, to the data, and you get some sort of point estimate, essentially, what we would call it in statistics. And you're kind of basing inferences based on that. So can, maybe we can leverage on that somehow. But when we do this, there's, there's kind of multiple types of uncertainty. You might have uncertainty in your inputs. So you don't know what they are. And so if you just get a point estimate of those, it might even be a very unstable point estimate. That's not going to be good. You'd like to quantify uncertainty in the input. Um, the model might not exactly characterize the observed data. Probably a hell of a lot better than some sort of really black box model that doesn't have any mechanistic structure in it. But there still might be some slight biases or slight problems with the model that you might actually want to learn, okay? Um, you might not be able to model everything as well. And so you might have, you know, a mechanistic model and you have multiple cell lines of different types and yeah, from multiple people. And there's a little bit of heterogeneity in the inputs. You don't have much, much data and you'd like, to, you'd like to borrow information somehow statistically, get some gains of the statistical approach while also having, having a me mechanistic modeling approach that doesn't just give you a big black box that's not interpretable. Okay, and so the Bayesian paradigm is potentially quite useful for solving these types of problems. So, so let's go into some details a little bit more. So it might not be possible to analytically express the likelihood function of the data under a complicated model. Um, and so how can we do that? How can we plug into the Bayesian rule in that case? Well, what's commonly done is, is one of two approaches. The, the first is to use some sort of solver without considering UQ and certainty quantification and put the solution in as the center of some statistical distribution. And I'll, I'll describe a typical approach that people use um, shortly. Um, the other is to use what's called approximate Bayesian computation. So we don't have an explicit form for the likelihood, but there's actually very, very rich literature out there. As long as you can forward simulate from your model, you can use the kind of Bayesian paradigm for, for UQ, and this has been done in quite, quite complicated settings. 
Okay. So, um, you know, maybe the canonical approach for uncertainty quantification and mechanistic modeling and, and physical modeling is a Gaussian process. It's often called Gaussian process emulation. And in the literature, it's often called computer model emulation. Okay, so let's, let's say why those are our outputs, maybe our data, and that's some, some sort of function through, maybe it's not easy to express analytically, it's through some sort of system of equations, g of x um, given some theta, okay? And so that's describing the input-output relationship under some mechanistic model, it might be multiscale. Okay, and so that based on some data, we get some data, we apply some solver, and we get some g hat, okay? Um, and so there can be errors in the solver. Maybe there was uncertainty in the input theta. There might be some slight biases in the model. Even if you have a really wonderful model, it never ever actually fits everything perfectly. There might be some measurement issues that, that cause, cause biases. Um, and so to account for this in the Gaussian process emulation literature, you might say, well, let's say yi equals mu of xi with, um, plus epsilon i, okay? So the mu, we, we then, is some unknown um, function relating input to output. We just say, well, let's draw that from a Gaussian process, which is a really flexible kind of stochastic process that allows uncertainty in this random function. Let's center the Gaussian process on g hat, our, uh, our solution from our solver for our mechanistic model. Um, and then we have some sort of covariance function c, and we have a little bit of measurement error epsilon i. Okay. And so the Gaussian process is really quite flexible um, model. It provides a prior for an unknown function mapping from inputs to outputs, and this is just shows one realization and kind of fits with some, some, some sort of spatial data. And so the realizations are random functions or stochastic processes centered on that g hat, our solution to our mechanistic model on average. And the variance and smoothness of those realizations is controlled by the covariance function. And so we have some sort of covariance function um, C of x, x prime, which is parameterized by some, some C parameters, which are potentially unknown. Okay. And, and typically what people do in practice is they put in some sort of off-the-shelf covariance, um, and I'll be describing a more mechanistic approach shortly. Like an x squared exponential would be a default covariance function that people use often, and it's parameterized by uh, a, a phi 1 and phi 2. So phi, phi 1 is controlling sort of amplitude variation, and phi2 is controlling smoothness. And th this would be kind of generated, you're generating a GP, it's around your mechanistic model solution, but it has some wobbliness that, um, allowing for bias. And, and this type of approach has quite nice properties. As you get more and more data, it'll actually be able to consistently estimate what that bias is. And so it might be that if you have a little sample size, you rely more on your mechanistic model, but then you're kind of moving away more to one of these machine learning approaches that can kind of be based more on the data as you get more information. The one reason people use Gaussian processes a lot is that they're super convenient computationally. And so, um, in particular, they have that conjugacy property, and so the, the Gaussian evaluated each of the data points, each of the inputs, that joint distribution is just a multivariate Gaussian. And so then if you have Gaussian measurement errors as a, as a simple model, then you can just have marginalize out the Gaussian and get just an analytic form for the posterior of this random function uh, given the data, given your, um, you know, deterministic model estimate, and given your covariance parameters. Okay, so the, um, this kind of vanilla approach to UQ and the GPs has been, been widely used and successful, but has some issues. Um, it would be really wonderful for, like, these two communities to work together, I think, like some people who do mechanistic modeling and, and, and people like me or Larry, uh, kind of bridge th these, these two communities to kind of get the best of both worlds, I think, would be fantastic. And that was one of the reasons I think we're here today. So. Okay, so the off-the-shelf generic covariance function can lead to overly erratic and unstructured deviations from g hat. Um, and so it would be nice to be able to have more of a mechanistic um, statistical model that, like, inherits the, some of the behavior of your mechanistic model automatically. That would be amazing. So you might li like the realization to sort of look like solutions to SDEs, SPDs, or ODEs, PDs, et cetera. You might also like it to have a multi-scalar non-smooth character, which isn't natural for default usual Gaussian process approaches. So can we, can we come up with like mechanistic non-parametric Bayes approaches? I think certainly we can, and let, let's do it together. It would be really cool. I'll give a flavor for that today um, in the rest of the talk, okay? Um, so as a simple case, let's just give a simple case study on, on what you could call a mechanistic Gaussian process. 
Okay, and so we started working on this thing, muscle, uh, muscle activation data. There's a, and a very, very rich literature on, on physical mechanistic modeling of, of muscle activation. This is a force curve. Um, time is on the uh, x-axis, y is force. You're measuring this, these data in an, an animal model. And uh, for each subject under each condition, you have a force tracing curve. And, and, and one of the goals of the study was to see the effect of an exercise regime on, on young or old animals on this kind of muscle output, okay? Um, but previously, people were using very much a mechanistic modeling approach. And so you would model the observed function h of t, which I've shown there for a bunch of different animals, they raw data, as q of t times f of t, which is a product of isometric and stretch shortening components, um, which are usually defined by ODEs. So it provides a, a simple um, case study here relative to like PDE type models. Okay, and so you could, you could do solutions to the ODEs. They would need to be specific to each replicate. They don't fit the observed data perfectly. It's hard to build you a statistical framework for testing of differences across the different groups. Um, you don't have like a model for like a population of animals, and so those are all sort of issues. So can we, can we deal with all those things um, somehow? Well, the mechanistic in information in this case is, is quite, um, you can write through a quite simple model, maybe just a linear ODE. Um, and so we have some sort of linear system of, of ordinary differential equations. Um, the solution exists and can be expressed in this form as h of t is some integral of g of t of, of xi, r of xi, d xi. Um, g here is Green's function. Um, and the integral operator um, is linear, and so actually if we put in, if we feed in R of T is from a Gaussian process, then H of T is also from a Gaussian process. And something really interesting happens is that we, if, if I then draw realizations from that Gaussian process, it ends up looking a lot more like a solution to that, um, that system of ordinary differential equations. Um, and so we get some sort of a mechanistic information automatically through the kind of induced modified covariance kernel in the, in the Gaussian process. And so, um, so can we implement this for some data and see, see what we gain? Um, the exact solution to the resulting covariance is actually extremely ill-conditioned, and so you run into computational problems. Um, but we, we, we tried a, a run cut a method to approximate the ODE solution. I'll just show second-order results um, today based on an Euler-Toshi um, approximation, but you can do a higher order as well. It's uh, pretty, pretty easy. Um, and then you obtain a pretty simple posterior sampling algorithm, and we applied it to the muscle force data. And we can also, we can do a lot of things that we, we wouldn't be able to do easily with just solving the ODEs. We can, we can get, um, you know, posterior distributions for uncertain inputs. We can build a hierarchical model allowing uh, differences across the animals. We can allow slight biases in the, in the solution to the ODEs, et cetera. Okay. okay, so I'll just show some results and then, then wrap up. Um, so, so we analyzed the effect of this repetitive muscle contractions on muscle force. Uh, the data from 13 sessions from 15 young and 27 old rats, and there was 565 observations per session. The data here shows, uh, shows our model fits for one animal pre and post. There wasn't very much measurement error noise here, and so we got really accurate fit. I mean, it was sort of close to uh, uh, just solving an uh, ODE separately for each of these, um, these, these curves, but it wasn't exactly. There were, there were some notable, um, notable interesting biases in, in, in the usual ODE model applied in this setting. Um, we could also do some, you know, in terms of uncertainty quantification, we can do all sorts of things. So here, the top row shows the mean isometric contraction for pre and post exercise in an old, that's the top left, and young, young animal, okay? And so we have this, uh, this overall population mean specific to a group, um, and we can see the effect of the exercise on increasing muscle force, um, okay? And then the bottom shows differences between pre and post um, for the young and the old, along with credible bands showing, showing our uncertainty. Okay, so now we can do statistical inferences essentially under a mechanistic model. Okay, okay so, so to wrap up, there's, I say there's great potential for hybrid approaches combining Bayesian non-parametrics and mechanistic modeling of systems. Um, hopefully we can work together kind of moving forward on this. I illustrated in a really simple application with just an o ODE type setting to muscle contractions, but be really, really cool to do this for like PDs and more complicated multi-scale systems. 
you know, build, build some stochastic kind of statistical models that allow a little bit of uncertainty but inherit some of the allowability to model differences across animal, allow, get a probability distribution characterizing uncertainty in input, that would be fantastic, I think. And there's almost nothing in the literature on this. Um, yeah, so I said these things already. Um, another point that I'd like to make is that, you know, one of the issues is computationally, and there's this really nice uh, kind of software package coming out, STAN, which allows for kind of general implementation of Bayesian methods, and they're starting to put in a lot of uh, kind of differential equation or mechanistic modeling um, type uh, features within STAN, and so potentially we can kind of work with them to make, make the methods we develop like just generally and easily accessible um, to mechanistic modelers who might not be at all familiar with, with Bayesian computation. And I'll, I'll, stop, I'll stop that. Excellent. Thank you, David. This is exactly what we want to do to, to, to marry probabilistic and mechanistic model, if possible. And George also mentioned so, um, Just about the PDs, because that's what I actually followed in my first talk here today. I presented uh, solutions to PDs, linear PDs, and also nonlinear PDs, exactly the framework. But uh, this will give me the opportunity to say that um, there is actually a more organized effort by many groups now. We're organizing a workshop on probabilistic numerics uh, by, um, I organized with uh, Philip Henning and, uh, that you probably know, Michael Osborne and uh, Wadi from Caltech. Uh, it will be at the I ICERM in Brown University, the NSF Institute. Uh, one week will be tutorials like that and also this uh, merging of uh, mechanistic models that you call the PTs and ODEs uh, with um, uh, Bayesian processes and the numerical Gaussian processes also is not in the inquiry. Okay, that's really great. Yeah, there's a couple of really excellent people like Mark Girolami working in this area. Mark is part of, yes, Mark is also part of this group. Hi, I really enjoyed your talk. I'm very interested in incorporating UQ into our models. Um, you said that Michael Betancourt is here. Can you just raise your oh, hand, right. maybe? You said he was going to be here. Excellent. Yeah, he's right. I see him. All right, thank you very much. I'll go talk to him about UQ then. <laughs> I just wanted to, to emphasize again what David said. One of the aims of this workshop is really to put researchers together from different communities like David and, and people from NIH. So please reach out to David and try to make a team. So we are trying to push this interagency funding uh, vehicles. It's new. We don't know how it's going to work, but we are hopeful. So try to make connections and maybe uh, submit a proposal to us. Okay, thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Lee Song. He's an associate professor at uh, GPAC, and before joining the university, he was briefly at Google, and his uh, expertise is in uh, machine learning, graph theory, time series prediction, etc. and he'll tell you more about it. Okay, uh, thank you for the invitation, and I'd be happy to share with you some of these machine learning tools uh, we use to in some sense, explore biological processes. Hopefully, these machine learning tools can sort of uh, provide some initial results from raw data such that we can do more realistic mechanistic models. So uh, today I'm going to talk about these uh, uh, essentially uh, natural biological processes. So very often biological processes such as cell cycle or even the life cycle of, uh, of uh, organism might involve many, many entities, right? They interact and then the interaction may change over time and then we can measure some uh, quantities on these uh, biological processes. Then we want to build some kind of initial model to understand how they are related to each other, these entities, and how you change over time. So I'm going to talk about these type of tools for understanding these biological processes. So I'm going to talk about two scenarios. Okay, the first scenario is going to be, um, uh, for instance, you have cell cycle. In these cases, uh, there may be a set of entities such as uh, genes which interact with each other and driving these biological processes. And uh, where often we have uh, some kind of a way to do experiments, measure the gene expression level. And we can determine in exactly what time we can measure the gene expression. And uh, you can do this type of uh, gene expression measurement for cell cycle or even the entire life cycle of uh, organism. 
Um, in this case, that uh, I'm going to introduce this time series model and also the network kind of time series model for it. And in the second case, it's quite different. For instance, this might occur uh, in the case when you have electronic healthcare records. And the, the, the time you observe a particular event is not going to be regular. It's not going to determine probably by the experimenter. So you only observe when something occurs, okay? That's typically the case. So in this case, the timing information, especially the, the, the time interval between two events, is going to be random variable. It's not something determined by experimenter. So we have to use slightly different type of model for this type of temporal data to understand its dynamics. Again, there may be some kind of network behind, for instance, in this case, the diseases you might want to understand. And then based on this understanding exploration, you want to for some more uh, me mechanistic models. So let me start from this first case. So suppose you have this cell cycle. Uh, you will be able to measure thousands of genes, the gene expression simultaneously at each time point that you determine to experiment. And then what you want to do is to, uh, based on these uh, gene expression experiments, you want to reverse engineer the network behind this uh, gene expression, okay? There are many, many machine learning models behind it. So I'm going to uh, just explain a few uh, which are popular nowadays in machine learning. The first type of model is going to be something called steady model. So in some cases, uh, when this biological process is not evolving very fast, in a, in a relatively short time interval, maybe uh, the process doesn't change too much. You believe that there's a single steady network, which is governing the uh, expression of genes, then you will use something called the Markov random filter model, right? Or maybe Gaussian graphical model. So in this case, uh, each one is xi is going to correspond to the value or the gene expression value for a particular gene. So uh, in your model, you're proposing some probabilistic model for uh, the uh, observation of this gene expression. So you will incorporate terms like uh, xi multiplied by xj, some kind of interaction between the genes. And there's a coefficient, theta ij, which governs the strength of interaction between these two genes. So if you uh, actually uh, take out all these coefficients and put it into the matrix, then it's going to be the matrix, uh, or a square matrix, the size of the number of genes by number of genes. And then the sparsity pattern of these matrix is going to correspond to these uh, G, uh, uh, regulatory network or, or co-expression network. And there's some machine learning tools and optimization tools to help you reverse engineer this type of network from gene expression data. So once you have this kind of network, you can look at the property of the network and come up forming some new hypothesis and maybe forming some kind of mechanism model to explain uh, what you see in the gene expression. So this is the simplest steady network model. You only uh, try to reverse engineer as, or estimate a single network based on uh, multiple uh, gene expression data, okay? So uh, you can uh, go a little bit more advanced when, if you believe that somehow there's some relationship between the gene expression between two time points. And you can actually propose some kind of model linking the gene expression at time t, xt, to the gene expression at time t plus one and you will try to explain how the gene expression at the next time point are driven by the gene expression in the previous time point. Again, uh, in order to uh, in, uh, express this relationship, you will have this parameter matrix theta, uh, which is also the number of genes by number of genes. The sparsity pattern of these uh, theta is going to uh, correspond to the network, in some sense, how these genes are interacting in, in these different time points. Um, you, you can do this uh, dynamic base type of model, network kind of model, together with the, the steady model I express, explained to you. And then uh, essentially you will have these additional edges, you can think about it, uh, in this case, across time points. So the previous network you get, uh, the network within a time point, in this case you're getting some kind of network across time points, okay? Um, this is the essentially dynamic uh, base network. And you can also go to even more advanced cases. So uh, if you believe that biological processes are changing very fast and, and you're measuring this gene expression data across a, a, a pretty long time interval, and then uh, you can actually try to do something more ambitious. Uh, try to reverse engineer uh, the network for each time point, and this network is going to change from time point to time point. So this is an extremely difficult and challenging uh, expression problem. But in machine learning, somehow we have figured out a set of uh, in some sense assumptions, which allows you uh, to actually uh, reverse engineer this type of network on data and provide some guarantee for it. So there are two scenarios I just want to talk about briefly, uh, or two type of assumptions I want to talk about it briefly that allows you to do this type of reverse engineering. So in this case, uh, again, you will have some kind of steady network model for each time point. 
So this XT, and it's going to follow some kind of Markov random field where this primary theta follows some kind of sparsity pattern. And, but you have one network for each time point. You have X, X1 follow uh, one network, and X2 for a different network. So uh, you want to get one network for each one of these snapshots. So the first type of assumption will make this type of challenge estimation work is going to be something called smoothness assumption. Uh, the first type of smoothness assumption is saying the network, the topology will remain pretty much the same, but the coefficients governing the strength of interaction is going to change slowly across time. And then uh, in this case, we can actually use some kind of a kernel smoothing approach to uh, make this estimation possible. The second case when it is possible to estimate this type of type of writing network from the data is going to be the case uh, when uh, it, within a particular time interval, the network uh, remains pretty stable, the same network, but at some point, suddenly, uh, there's abrupt changes in the network structure. So uh, it is these abrupt changes. And in this case, you can also form some kind of cost optimization estimate the network from the data. So these are the uh, three scenarios. Uh, one scenario is you want to estimate static network. Based on gene expression data, you are deciding where to measure, okay? And the second case is you estimate dynamic based network, which you actually measure the relationship between the gene expression across different time points. The third case is a very challenging case. You believe the biological process is changing very fast. Uh, you actually want to estimate a sequence of network from the data, one for each time point. But you leverage some kind of statistical smoothness to actually make this possible, okay? So the, these are the, the three type of model where advanced model machine learning helps you to forming some kind of hypothesis about the interaction between these biologic entities. So in a sec uh, once you have these type of estimation algorithm, you, you get to a network. You can visualize this network and see lots of patterns, for instance, in this case. Um, once you have this uh, estimated network, um, sort of uh, explaining interaction between pair of genes, you can also group these genes according to the ontology information and see how different groups of genes are interacting with each other. For instance, this is one example that's where we reverse engineer from some kind of time series um, uh, uh, data from uh, just Drosophila. And then uh, at different point in time, uh, you see different network, and you can sort of, based on this type of network, get some kind of understanding how different group of genes are interacting with each other at different point in time. This is sort of some kind of global way, and you can also look at some other statistical networks such as the clustering coefficients, how tightly genes are interacting with other genes in the neighborhood and also look at the size of network, how many interactions in total for network across time. So for this uh, development process of Drosophila, uh, in that particular data, uh, there's a four very distinct stages. The first stage is the embryonic stage. The second stage is larva stage and pupa stage and the adult stage. In different, different type of stages, you expect that the gene might interact very differently, right? And some genes have something to do with embryonic development you expect them to be more active at that stage. Some, some genes are related to muscle development, you expect them to be more active in later stage. You can look at all this. For instance, uh, we can actually look at uh, two time points where uh, the, uh, in some sense, the network size, the, number of, the total number of edges in the network are pretty much the same. But in these two time points, the costing coefficients are very different. You can visualize and take a look at this network. So um, the, this, uh, the first time point is going to be the embryonic stage. And in this case, actually, you see lots of small clusters, okay? And then um, and in the second stage, uh, this is a pupa stage, and the network is much more connected. Everything is almost interacting with everything else. Of course, you can also look at those uh, particular set of genes. You already know uh, they belong to a particular function. For instance, you can look at a set of around 20 genes, which you know it's related to some kind of muscle development. And um, you can see the activity according to this network connectivity, um, only in the later stage, pupa stage and adult stage, actually you see more activities from this group of genes. So if you have a pair of genes you are interested in, uh, you already know they are interacting, you wonder when this pair of genes is going to be more uh, tightly connected. You can also look at the sequence of networks, and actually uh, you will find that uh, some of these uh, estimated networks actually reflect our prior knowledge, our prior understanding of uh, uh, the interaction between pair of genes. For instance, for the first example, it's going to be these MSN genes and DOC genes. It's uh, labeled in, in these uh, Drosophila databases as something related to regulation of embryonic cell shape. And then uh, only in the embryonic stage, uh, you, you actually found that, that these pair of genes are, are present in the estimate net network. And then for the another pair of example, 
is going to be these SMO and DI genes is related to the development of compound eyes. It's not going to be active only in the later stage. So you can actually find that many of these existing biological knowledge are reflected in this network, estimate based on these uh, gene expression data. Okay? And, and this is the second case uh, when these, uh, in, in some sense, the temporal information is going to be very different. The temporal information, uh, the, the time gap between two events is not controlled by the experimenter, but it's, uh, uh, it's recorded when something happens, for instance. When the patient visits the hospital, right, you record precisely the timing information uh, when this patient visits the hospital, and then you're also going to look at the corresponding uh, symptoms. Right? So in this particular example, I'm using different shape or mark markers to denote the type, different type of diagnosis. So you have different patients, and they might have very different patterns. So uh, in this particular case, uh, one thing very important is uh, uh, you should not use the traditional time series analysis approach to do it. So traditional time series analysis approach is treating the time as index, but in this particular case, I just mentioned that the time interval between two events carry lots of information. So you want to, of course, take into account that the, each one of these uh, time point and event is going to be different type, and also the interval between two time points is very important, okay? So we want to model this type of thing. And then uh, in this case, uh, this type of data is actually called point processes in the statistical and machine learning literature. And, um, it, and you will actually want to use something called the intensity function to model the likelihood of seeing these sequence of events. So, um, so in particular, if you're interested in how different diseases are interacting with each other. So you can actually uh, dissect uh, these single traces or single records for these patients the record for a single patient into uh, multiple timelines, and you're going to actually assign one timeline for each one of these diseases, okay? So that helps you actually to figure out the relationship between different diseases. So you can imagine that one patient has, has been decomposed into these four timelines. Suppose you have four different diseases of interest, and you have multiple patients. It's going to be multiple instantiation of these uh, processes. You want to leverage the, the data or these type of event data for multiple patients trying to figure out some kind of disease probability network or how different diseases are interacting with each other, okay? So uh, the uh, sort of, uh, in this case, because we are treating the time as random variables, so the best way to model is using some kind of density model over these time intervals. Suppose you are able to uh, define or have some kind of mechanistic model for the uh, you know, the time interval given the history, okay? Then you should be able to write out the likelihood of seeing this entire sequence of events. And then if you have these likelihoods, and within the likelihood of the parameter, you should be able to estimate a parameter using maximum likelihood, okay? So when you are dealing with these kind of event data, people in the electrical engineering or statistics community has already developed lots of theory for it. And then a quantity that is commonly used to describe this condensed density is not, is, is actually uh, intensity function. It's not, they, they're not actually, uh, in some sense, modeling the density directly, but modeling something called the intensity function. It's going to be the ratio uh, between these density and the wild function. And one advantage of using the intensity function is, it, as long as it's not negative, then it's okay. You don't need it to be normalized. But it's tightly connected to the density and the wild function and once you have the intensity function, you can actually figure out the um, density function and also the survival function, okay? So, uh, uh, of course, another uh, uh, interesting property of these uh, condition intensity functions, you can actually uh, design it with lots of prior knowledge, something you understand about it and have lots of meaning, okay? So, for instance, I'm going to give you an example how you actually use these type of prime process model intensity function to model the uh, disease comorbidity network. So in this case, suppose you want to model two phenomena. The first same thing is, if you, if you want a particular patient to have a particular type of disease, the disease is going to trigger more, 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 more observation of the same type of disease. It's just like if someone gets uh, ill because of a particular disease, it's, going to, it's more likely that you're going to see the same kind of phenomena, a diagnosis from the same patient. The second phenomenon you might want to model is something like uh, the triggering mechanism between different diseases. Diseases, they not, do not occur uh, separately from each other, but they somehow influence each other. So you want to somehow model these two type of phenomenon. 
one particularly uh, suitable model for modeling the triggering effect is something called Hawkes process, the self exciting point process. So essentially, you want to, for instance, uh, model the, the triggering of uh, historical occurrence of the same disease, then you want to sort of model dependency between all these past uh, events to the future event. Uh, one very good model is called this Hawkes model. Well, what is Hawkes model? So every time you observe something occurring in the past, you're going to put some kind of kernel function, triggering kernel function on top of one, each one of these events. And then you're going to sum together all these uh, triggering kernel functions, and then that's going to be your intensity function. This intensity function, as I explained earlier, as long as it's non negative, it, it's okay. So uh, essentially, the effect of putting this triggering kernel function on top of e each one of these events, if you have lots of uh, uh, events happening in the recent past, then you're going to get a, this kernel function is going to sum together, you're going to get a high intensity function. And then uh, similarly, you can actually use this kind of triggering mechanism across different diseases. So you will have just have more turns, and then you're not just going to consider the uh, uh, historical information from the same disease, you're also going to consider the effects of other diseases on this particular disease. Again, then you will have to use some kind of uh, uh, you know, uh, interaction uh, coefficient, the theta here, ij. So if you put this theta ij in the matrix, again, it's going to, in this case, the number of diseases by number of diseases, and there's many machine learning ways, uh, models, or optimization algorithms to actually reverse engineer these, uh, these uh, theta matrix and sparsity version of it uh, from the data, okay? Then once you do that, then you will be able to get a network like this, and uh, each node in this network is going to correspond to one disease, and then the, the arrow in this particular network is going to correspond to those sparsity pattern in the theta matrix. You can actually look at this, uh, this network and see some components in this network actually correspond nicely to particular type of disease. For instance, the upper left corner is related to somehow these uh, cerebral kind of artery disease, and then the other panel A is going to correspond to some kind of heart failure or disease. So, um, so these two type of uh, models, for networks, one is for the cases when you actually, the experimenter can actually measure the biological process in regular time interval, use time series model. You can put static network model behind it, and a dynamic based model behind it. You can also reverse engineer time variety network across the process. In the second case, uh, the time interval is not de determined by the experimenter, but uh, you observe this time interval as something happens. So you use very different model pretty much based on these uh, prime process or multi-dimensional prime process. Of course, I've been exclusively talking about using just the temporal information and maybe type of uh, event type information. But actually, uh, there are many other information you can incorporate into this type of uh, machine learning models. Uh, for instance, you might have actually some image data or lab test or some, even some test descriptions. You can actually jointly model this temporal information with those those time series model and the prime process model I just explained. And, then, uh, and by using this model, you can actually get some kind of exploration of some complicated biological process where we don't understand too much. And based on this exploration, you might form a new hypothesis and form a more detailed model and conduct some experiments. Uh, that's uh, what I want to talk about today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know, are there any questions? One. Thanks. Thanks. I liked your talk. And in the first part of the talk, I had a question. So yeah. how do you actually quantify the uncertainty? It's also related to the previous talk. In your, um, in your predictions of which pairs of genes. OK. Uh, so the, in that case, um, uh, the, the many model in that space has been frequented in nature. Okay. You will get, a, in some sense, point estimate for the network structure. But there are some recent development trying to actually assign some p-value to the network you have. And uh, I think you will be able to do that. Okay. Yeah. I also had a question for you about, that, about the uh, gene regulatory network. Sometimes the answer is, is uh, not better algorithms, but just better data. And in, in the case of gene regulatory networks, the missing piece of data that would really help, I think, quantify these directions in, in the, uh, uh, which transcription factors are actually binding to which uh, genes is to use ChIP-seq data and to incorporate that with the expression data. And uh, so I, I guess I, I, there's been publications showing that 
this, this can be used to improve the regulatory network predictions. And I was just curious, like, um, how, how you would incorporate that ChIP-seq data with your algorithm. So that's a very good question. And um, there are multiple ways you can incorporate this, uh, multimodal data in some sense. So one way to incorporate, for instance, there are additional data sets. For instance, you might already know some kind of protein interaction network. Or people have done a wet like experiment, figure out a gene gene interaction network, right? So one way to actually incorporate this type of information is going to be uh, using these uh, known uh, biological facts as a regularization for your sparsity pattern. You want your estimate sparsity pattern somehow to be similar to these uh, prior knowledge, but uh, you also want the data to speak about the actual network. So this is one way. The second way you talk about chip stick data and the gene expression data, you can actually let them share some common network behind it. But uh, in terms of the journey model for these uh, gene expression data, you can let them, this two type of data share the network structure, but the coefficient is different. There's a way to estimate these networks this way. There's a multitask learning, okay, in some sense. Okay, okay, thank you. And one more last question. So I have a question on uh, um, uh, the first part. We, so if there's, mod, if there's memory in the system, uh, how do you deal with that? Because I think you just uh, assume a Markovian assumption, right? So you just get the information from the previous time set, but if there's like correlations. Uh, yeah, very good question. And then for the time series model, I explained it's pretty much Markovian uh, for the dynamic base network. But uh, for this later model I talked about using this intensity function, actually I have shown an example in called a longer term memory. This Hox process. Yeah, yeah no, I, I know the, ho the Hox yeah. process, but, but it's sort of also anticipatory because it goes ahead, right? It doesn't just look at the memory before. That's why it, it look at, uh, let me just make sure. So uh, every event that happened in the past, okay. it's going to add a trigger and kernel. It's going to join together affecting the future one. In some sense, it's a pretty long memory. Okay. Yeah, yeah, there's uh, some flexibility there. Okay. okay, thank you again. Great speech. Uh, our next speaker is Elizabeth Ogburn. She's assistant professor at uh, biostatistics at Johns Hopkins University. And uh, as you know, with big data, they're not only big, they are also very complex. And many of statistical tools that we use are not appropriate for those settings. And Beth, Beth is working actively in that area. And today she's going to talk about something I think is very relevant for this community, and that is. Uh, how to infer causal relationships from observational data, which is really, really hard. So um, we're waiting for uh, your talk to be brought up. Um, I won't actually describe any of the solutions in detail, but if you're interested in, in the details or in learning more or in possible collaboration, please um, approach me or send me an email. Um, so, uh oh, how do I advance the slide? Okay, so everybody is familiar with the maxim that association is not causation, um, but I think we're all tempted to interpret associations as being causal nonetheless. It's, it, published papers are very good at including a very narrow, specific caveat against interpreting associational relationships causally, um, but there tends to be, there's, a, there's just a natural inclination that we all have to put a causal spin on association. Um, in general. And so there are a lot of 
different structures that could give rise to, let's say, an association between obesity and diabetes, one of which is that obesity causes diabetes. Um, but we could also have reverse causation, where diabetes causes obesity. We could have confounding, in this case, by genetics, where there's a common cause that causes both obesity and diabetes. Or we could have a situation where obesity and diabetes have a common cause that we've conditioned on. And this last structure is a form of selection bias. It's technically called collider bias. Um, and it's responsible for a lot of the paradoxes in the health literature. So the obesity paradox is a series of results, a series of papers that found evidence that obesity is actually protective against mortality among diabetics. Um, and of course, this is super counterintuitive. There are lots of ways to explain this besides a true causal relationship. Um, one of the ways of explaining it among older populations is that both obesity and diabetes are, result in an elevated risk of premature mortality. So if you condition on people who are still alive after a certain age, those people are likely, those, those people who are still alive and have both obesity and diabetes are likely to be extra robust people. They're otherwise extremely healthy. And so that creates an association that, in fact, is not causal. Um, and so what, what causal inference is about is articulating the assumptions under which we can take any statistical model. There, you know, statistics has decades and centuries worth of um, models that are really great at drawing, finding relationships, predictive and associational relationships, finding patterns in data. And causal inference is about the being really clear and, and very rigorous about the assumptions under which we're licensed to use those statistical models to infer causal relationships specifically, as opposed to um, just stopping at the claim of an association. Um, and in most cases, or in many cases, this is just about using off-the-shelf statistical models that have already been developed and um, licensing a causal interpretation for the parameters or the estimates. Although in some cases, and I'll, I'll, allude, I'll talk about some of these later, um, being interested in a causal effect actually necessitates tweaking or uh, an existing model or developing a new model. Um, so what is a causal effect? Um, it, we say that x causes y if if you could intervene to change the value of x, that would result in a change in the value of y. Um, so these are about hypothetical interventions or hypothetical experiments. We can't always perform those experiments. Um, for example, it would never be ethical and possibly not even feasible to intervene on somebody's obesity to see whether it increased their risk of diabetes. So we define causal effects in terms of counterfactual outcomes. The, um, the hypothetical outcome that we would have observed for a particular person or a particular population if we could have set that person's exposure or treatment to a specific value. Um, and so let's say that the, the NIH is interested in learning whether sitting in the back or the front of the room affects the probability that all of us will uptake new methods after attending this meeting. If they would thought about it, they could have randomized everybody in the room to sit in either the front or the back. And when you have a randomized trial, you think that the people who sit in the front and the back of the room are equivalent on every systematic measure. So if we want to know what would have happened in a world where we had had everybody sit in the front of the room, we just look at the people who are sitting in the front of the room and we say, oh, okay, that's what would have happened if everybody had sat in the front of the room. Um, because we weren't randomized, there might be some systematic differences between people in the back of the room and people in the front of the room. Um, so we have to, to look to data of the, the data to extrapolate. So we might think that 40-year-old biologists from the East Coast who sit in the back of the room and sit in the front of the room are, have no systematic differences. So we'll ask, um, what would have happened if all the 40-year-old biologists from the East Coast had sat in the front of the room? We look at those who did, and we extrapolate within those stratum. And that's what, when, we're, when we condition on covariates and um, think that that gives us a better sense of a causal effect, that's what we're doing. We're, we're extrapolating within levels of covariates. And I just, to link this back to this morning's conversation, I think one of the, the big challenges for electronic health records and other really rich sources of observational big data is that we're often missing some of those strata. strata. So it might be the case, we might have an, an analogous case in EHR where all of the 40-year-old biologists from the East Coast are sitting in the front of the room. So we can't extrapolate to what would have happened if some of them had been in the back of the room. And we have to use other tools to to extrapolate, and those tools, um, they increase uncertainty and they, they um, undermine the, the confidence
confidence that we can have, or they require stronger assumptions in order to draw causal conclusions from the data. Okay, so the simplest types of questions that we're interested in causal inference are just does X some point treatment cause Y some point outcome? Um, and even answering these questions can be really hard because of issues of confounding, because we can't always run a randomized trial, because even if we can run a randomized trial, there's always issues of um, selection bias, missing data, um, small sample sizes, um, different or vague definitions of treatment, different ways of measuring treatment, measurement error. There's a whole host of reasons that these problems are hard. And so this is just a, a cartoon I found about one particularly famous example where for, for decades um, or for years in the 80s and 90s, postmenopausal women were commonly prescribed hormone replacement therapy because it was thought to be protective against coronary heart disease. But eventually um, evidence mounted that in fact it's not protective and it may even increase the risk of coronary heart disease. Um, and this is just an example of a, a, a question that's very easy to define, very easy to understand, but still quite hard to answer with uh, observational data um, or even with randomized trial data. Um, but of course, we're often interested in much harder questions. These are harder to answer, and I'll, I'll describe a couple of these um, endeavors. So first I want to talk about mediation analysis. Let's say that we, we have ascertain to the best of our ability that there is a causal effect of X on Y, so hormone replacement therapy on heart disease. Um, we might want to decompose that effect into a, a direct effect that bypasses a mediator and an indirect effect that goes through a mediator. So for example, we might want to know how much of the effect of coronary heart disease on, or of hormone replacement therapy on coronary heart disease is mediated by cholesterol levels. Um, there's the, Methods for mediation analysis have been part of the, the standard applied statistical toolbox for a very long time, um, but the traditional methods are, are usually fall short of the causal interpretations that people give them. So the traditional methods run two, two regression um, equations. They regress the outcome on the treatment and the outcome on the treatment and the mediator. And these methods will usually not um, legitimize a causal interpretation. So if, if not all of the relationships among the variables are linear, these methods will fail. If there's any treatment mediator interaction, these methods will fail. Um, if there's any confounder of the mediator outcome relationship that's affected by treatment, these methods will fail. So instead what we want to do is, is move away from the models. So, so we, we're not going to think about regression models first. We're going to think about what are the actual counterfactual definitions of the effects we're interested in, and then we'll build up modeling techniques from that. Um, so there are lots of different ways to define mediation effects in terms of counterfactuals, but it turns out really interestingly that there's only one um, pair of definitions that allows us to decompose the total effect into either the sum or the product of the indirect effect and the direct effect, and that's obviously really desirable. We don't just want to, to estimate something that corresponds vaguely to these two pathways, we want to know, are, do these two pathways total to the total effect of X on Y? Otherwise, they're not really interpretable. Um, and these effects are called the natural direct and natural indirect effects. The natural direct effect um, bypasses cholesterol. It holds cholesterol fixed at the counterfactual value we would have seen for, for each person's cholesterol value if we had not given them hormone replacement therapy. And then it toggles hormone replacement therapy between on and off. Um, the, the natural indirect effect, on the other hand, um, holds hormone replacement therapy constant and toggles cholesterol between its counterfactual value if we did assign hormone replacement therapy and if we didn't assign hormone replacement therapy. These are really exotic causal effects. They're, they're asking what would happen if we could simultaneously turn hormone replacement therapy off and on. Um, and there's no hy even hypothetical randomized trial that could, uh, that could identify these effects. Um, but even though they're really exotic and weird, they're the only um, coherent definition of mediation effects that allows us to decompose the total effect into the indirect and the direct effect. And um, people have, been, have done a lot of work on, on being very clear about the exact assumptions about a data generating process and a, a state of the world that would license um, looking at observed data, running a model, and then in interpreting. It's actually, you can't use quite standard models for this, but you can use 
small tweaks on standard models um, and interpreting some um, functional of the parameters as these effects. And they've been used to, in a variety of applications. So to show that some of the polymorphisms that increase the risk of lung cancer are mediated mainly through smoking behavior um, to examine the extent to which the effect of abruption on perinatal mortality is mediated through the increased risk of, of preterm delivery and, and other applications. Um, so next I want to talk about longitudinal data structures. Um, this is another case where we have tons and tons of statistical tools that are really great at finding patterns in longitudinal data, finding associations between different features of the, those patterns. Um, but when we're interested specifically in the causal effect of a treatment that changes over time on an outcome, we have to be really careful about how we define that effect and um, you can't use standard models to estimate that effect. So this is a diagram, a, a very simplified diagram that shows the relationship between antiretroviral therapy as a treatment for HIV, um, where there's an outcome here that's changing over time that is CD4 count or viral, viral HIV load. Um, and where the, in, in this extremely simple world, we're interested in the overall effect of antiretroviral treatment. So this is a longitudinal treatment that changes over time, and we're interested in the sort of mass effect of all of these different treatment decisions on CD4 count at some end time point. Um, the problem here is that um, this intermediate value of CD4 count is a confounder. It's a confounder for the effect of the antiretroviral treatment at time one on the last CD4 count. But it's also a mediator. It's a mediator for the effect of antiretroviral treatment at time zero on the outcome. So if we just condition on this, which is what you are able to do in any standard statistical models, you're going to control for this confounding, but you're going to essentially con condition away part of this mediated effect. So there's no, um, there's no standard associational model that can handle this uh, a confounder that is both a confounder and a mediator. And so people have developed a lot of new models that are capable of, of dealing with this structure. Um, but they're, and there's nothing statistically challenging about them, but they really are new models. They're, um, they, they, operate, they operate in a very different way on the observed data distribution than any of the models that have been developed for finding patterns or prediction or association. Um, one of them is actually called marginal structural models, or MSMs. So that's what I think of when I see MSM. Um, and these have been used in a ton of different applications. Um, they've been used perhaps most famously um, to analyze large cohort studies, like the Nurses Health Study, to, um, to estimate the effects of different hypothetical interventions on diet and exercise. Um, they've been used to estimate the effect of aspirin on cardiovascular mortality, um, to develop adaptive treatment strategies for a lot of outcomes, including adolescent depression. And an adaptive treatment strategy is one that, that um, we don't, we're not just interested in what happens if you give a particular dose of ART at time zero and time one. We might be interested in what happens if you make decisions about how to dose ART in a particular way. So you, you have a decision rule at each time point that that makes the decision based on all of the past data that you've collected on a person and the covariates that you measure at a particular visit. Um, and so these methods are also what's used in a lot of endeavors about personalized medicine. Um, they allow you to, to um, estimate an optimal treatment rule for a particular person based on their, their changing data over time and to, um, to estimate what would happen in a population if you could give everybody their optimal treatment based on a particular set of observed covariates. Um, and then I just want to pay lip service to a lot of other topics that I'm not going to have time to go into in depth, but these are all things that I um, are close to my heart that I'm working on now or have worked on. Um, and if you're interested in more, learning more about these, please approach me or email me or if, you're, if you think the, that a collaboration using any of these areas would be helpful, I would love to talk more. Um, so thanks to Pedge's funding and ONR, I'm um, working on how to do causal inference when we don't just care about individuals and their own treatment decisions, but we have a network of interconnected people um, who might be affecting one another based on um, their treatment decisions or their behavioral decisions. So a lot of times with infectious diseases, um, we think that when you 
treat, or we know that when you treat one person, it doesn't just affect their own outcome, it can affect the whole population and the way that diseases spread through the population. And so um, I know this is something that probably a lot of you work on, but in the, in the causal inference world, this is a, an incredibly challenging problem because um, counterfactual outcomes become very high dimensional. We don't just care about the counterfactual outcome I would have received under treatment or under no treatment. We care about the counterfactual outcome in a world in which I and all of my contacts were treated or were not treated or had some treatment distribution or probability. Um, and that's a very complicated object to, to even think about, let alone learn about from observed data. Um, and, and there are also lots of interesting issues with whether when you have networks of, of interconnected subjects, do you want to think about an outcome as a joint distribution across all of the nodes in the network or a kind of equilibrium state that the network arrives at? Um, so that's a, an area of great interest for me. There's a lot of, um, of really interesting work about using instrumental variables when we know that we have unmeasured confounding. We know that there are some confounders of the treatment outcome relationship that we either haven't observed or that we fundamentally can't observe. Um, and then I, I want to highlight, I think this could be of, of particular interest to this community, um, a lot of work on a, a growing literature on generalizability or transportability of causal effects. So the idea here is that our, the study population is almost never the population of interest. We're usually performing studies on convenience samples or clinical populations, and we want to know how and when we're, we're licensed to generalize or transport something that we estimate in that study population to the population of interest. Um, and I think causal inference, the sort of philosophy of causal inference has a lot to say about this. Um, and then before I, I close, just a brief note about um, un assessing uncertainty in causal inference. So there are two sources of uncertainty whenever we're, we're interested in causal inference. The first is just plain old statistical uncertainty, and we're all familiar with this. This can be captured by confidence intervals or predictive intervals or standard errors. But more important and, and more interesting is uncertainty about whether the fundamental assumptions on which our analysis rests hold. And this is obviously a problem for anything. We've talked a lot of today about um, how models are never perfect. Um, but in causal inference in particular, there's kind of a, um, with a lot of models, there's a gray area between assumptions holding and failing to hold, and you can, you can often think of when the assumptions don't entirely hold, you might be estimating something that's close to what you want to be estimating, whereas there's a very sharp line in causal inference. If, if the assumptions don't hold, you are not licensed to interpret your estimate as um, a, a causal parameter. So uncertainty about these fundamental assumptions can, can sometimes be assessed with sensitivity analyses, where you, you say, okay, maybe I don't believe that there's no unmeasured confounding, so I'm going to rerun my analysis as if there were an unmeasured confounder um, and test the robustness of my original analysis to the, the failings of these assumptions. Um, so I think the, the way that causal inference should be practiced in the best possible world or the way that people should think about interpreting analyses causally is with a huge dose of skepticism and I think as many sensitivity analyses as possible to really, we never believe assumptions. Um, the assumptions that you have to make to learn causal effects are extremely strong, um, so we should always test the robustness of findings to failures of those assumptions. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, are there any questions? So we can actually uh, start the panel discussion. I'd like to invite Lee and David to join us. So we have a first question over there. Thank you very much. Uh, they were very interesting talks. I'm not quite sure I understood the vast majority of it, so that's why I'm going to ask the question that I'm going to ask. Uh, so it's unclear to me how these various methods, particularly the uncertainty quantification, relate to biological heterogeneity in terms of the generative heterogeneity of phenotypes 
associated with common shared structures across some region of parameter space within those particular mechanistic or quasi-mechanistic processes, right? Because, you know, there's measurement error, and then you guys have talked about that. There's data sparseness. You don't know what's in between. You know, but we know that, that biological organisms display a considerable range of outcomes given as constrained a set of conditions that we can control. And it's unclear to me how these methods can help increase the explanatory power or assess the, 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 the quality of explanatory power of a proposed generative model in terms of capturing that kind of biological heterogeneity. Does that make any sense? Am I completely off? Hello? Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe a bit of sense. I, I, I mean, I guess my, my thought was that if you had a mechanistic model for a given cell line or whatever unit, and then you wanted to allow heterogeneity, you might not have a good mechanistic model for what that distribution across units looks like. And, and so certainly you could use Bayesian nonparametric methods for estimating that population distribution and then flexibly characterize heterogeneity in your mechanistic model that way, statistically estimating the distribution of me mechanistic parameters across the population. Does that I'd like to add something. Okay. So I think uh, mechanistic model and statistical model in some sense should go in closed loop. So at the beginning, maybe we know very little about a mechanism of particular organism. Then we can use statistical model to explore, uh, I mean, some guess our initial idea and hypothesis for this case. And once we have better understanding mechanistic model, uh, in statistical model, we can use some mechanism called regularization, actually incorporating those things uh, you just talked about. For instance, you know two parts of the model they have to share the same kind of parameter. You can actually incorporate that kind of uh, information into this statistic model. And uh, once you have uh, this kind of mechanistic uh, uh, mechanism, encoding your statistic model, actually you can improve the statistical power of your, your, your statistic model. And then you can use this newly incorporated information and reestimate your statistic model. That might offer you a new set of insights you go back to refine your mechanistic model. I see this as a closed loop and ongoing effort, and there's a nice interaction between the two. These two communities should really work together and then um, to, to push the boundary of our understanding. Yeah, yeah so I, I certainly agree that there has to be an iterative loop between you know, statistical analysis of the outputs of the models feeding back on the quality of the models that are generating that, that data. And I guess yeah, I guess I would have to talk to you offline because I'm not quite sure I, I'm getting it. Um, what David, I think, said makes kind of, again, I kind of understand that and it makes kind of sense what I'm thinking about, but I'm not going to take anyone else. Let me try time. taking a stab. I'm not sure I understood the question, but what it made me think about is the fact that, I mean, standard traditional statistics are about estimating averages and so you average over heterogeneity and uncertainty is left if you haven't captured all of the heterogeneity in the entire population that you care about in your sample. Um, but there are also statistical tools that are useful for identifying heterogeneity and identifying sources of heterogeneity, picking up heterogeneity that is meaningful for whatever you're estimating. Um, and so I just want to throw out there that that's also that's a, a kind of flip side of the traditional statistical paradigm that, that's quite right. powerful. So so I, again, don't want to take much time, but your, your third point actually sounded like that what I was interested in, but I'm not quite sure it ended up being that. So I'll talk to you. <laughs> okay. So I, I had a question on the causal inference. Uh, so when you have measurement errors, and let's say you are trying to use an instrumental variable to figure out whether A drives B or B drives A, so depending on if one of them is measured more precisely than the other, so what are the kind of available methods we have to be careful about because it could be our inference could wrongly determine the direction if one is uh, the measurement error in one variable is uh, less than the other. Um, so that's a great question. I, I purposely didn't talk about methods for um, 
determining the direction of a, a causal arrow. And that's because, um, first of all, I don't work on that area. And second of all, those methods are extremely model dependent. So they make very strong assumptions often of joint normality or, um, or um, well, I'd say very strong assumptions that I, I think, in, this is a, my personal philosophy, but I, I feel like they make them not very useful for health phenomena. They're very useful for astronomical measurements and things that, that we know behave very cleanly. Um, but, well, so I guess I'll end there. I could say some more things, but they wouldn't be very specific and <laughs> we so can... Just, just quickly, so I'm thinking about the context of two genes, for instance, like so one gene regulating another gene, just oh, an okay. observational gene expression. Yeah, yeah, that is an area where I think these methods might be useful, but I don't think I, I know enough about them to give you a useful answer. I just want to follow up on, on, on uh, the question about heterogeneity because uh, it seems like there's a couple ways that one could model it and, and, the, and ways that you could use um, uncertainty quantification. I just kind of want to propose like two kind of extreme conditions. One is where um, like, you, know, you suppose you have like spatial heterogeneity and you have a bunch of different models all of which have different parameters and they don't really communicate with each other. Uh, so that each one is operating individually, so you just have to take an ensemble of each of those conditions. The other one is where there's uncertainty in each of the, um, they, they, all do, they all do communicate with each other, and so they all, you can average over all of their, their uh, parameters. And so, you know, so one's kind of well mixed, the other one is completely uh, spatially separated, and you could imagine that reality is somewhere in between, and how do you use uncertainty quantification to try to figure out what that distribution ought to be. Yeah, so um, I mean, in statistics, we have these things called random effects, I guess, in some sense. And so you have these random effects um, parameters that are specific. And then if, so if they're spatially distributed, there's a big literature on like modeling a spatial dependence and random effects. And so one approach is to put a Gaussian process down spatially to kind of spatially smooth out um, those random effects. Or if they're not spatially distributed, they might have some distribution. You know, the simplest way is to model that as Gaussian, but there's a whole literature on estimating the distribution of the random effects non-parametrically. And so those types of ideas, I think, could be applied directly here. Um, in classical settings, the data that you measure from some simple exponential family likelihood or something, but instead you'd have this complicated me mechanistic model, but you'd be linking them together with the kind of random effects hierarchical modeling. I, I'd just like to add a little bit about this hierarchical modeling. So one very good example is uh, maybe modeling the um, different type of documents. Yeah? For instance, you can actually say that uh, these two particular com collection of samples or documents, they are very similar. And you might have already get the ontology of how they are related to each other. And then, um, you know, in this ontology and two bottom nodes, they're going to measure at some particular point. And you actually allow these uh, merging points to share statistics from both groups. As you go higher up in the hierarchy, it's going to share the statistics for the entire population. But because of the presence of hierarchy, each individual group is going to have its own heterogeneity captured. So that's one way that is very common in statistical machine learning used to capture this type of uh, global uh, similarity and also individual group uh, heterogeneity. Okay. question that I don't know if it's too philosophical, but we're talking about complex biological systems. And when we're trying to put a uh, stochastic or a statistical framework around this, we forget that heterogeneity is actually a good thing for a biological system. It increases the robustness of the system over time and for so-called random events. The only randomness I can see in this system that's constantly evolving, true randomness, uh, a mutation might not be truly random. It, it, you know, evolution is happening. So how can we put all this in a, in a biological or a physiological context? How do we know that the statistics itself isn't inherently biased by our trying to wrap the, our heads around this inherently complex problem? 
I mean, I, I think what we were trying to talk about was, so you have a mechanistic model, and so it might be a stochastic model of cells over time or something like you're talking about. Um, and, and so, but if you have that model, there might be some uncertainty in aspects of the model. There might be some heterogeneity that you can't model clearly uh, mechanistically. You don't have a clear mechanistic idea. And so you can kind of come in and kind of marry the mechanistic model together with a statistical, flexible statistical model, like a, a Bayesian non-parametric model, to try to characterize that uncertainty. Um, and so I, I think that it could be very broad. It could be these population of cells, mutations, wh whatever it is, um, you can kind of, kind of combine those two, two frameworks. And so you put in the uncertainty where you have it. Uh I'd like to add a little bit. Uh, um, so this mechanism model is, uh, in some sense, a uh, very nice model we can understand and interpret them. But very often when we try to validate this model, uh, we have to actually make actual measurement about the biological systems. So somehow we are limited by the way we can accurately measure these biological systems. There's always some kind of noise and um, um, uh, control defense introduced in our measurements. So this type of statistical model can actually take into account those kind of uncertainties and um, um, uh, provide you some kind of uh, model, especially in the initial exploration stage. You don't understand too much about a me mechanism. Then that helps you to form some kind of hypothesis for a more accurate model. Uh, I, th oh. um, I think it's, it's limiting and not the, the best idea to think of uncertainty purely as the standard error estimate that falls out of a statistical model. Uncertainty is all of the things that you don't know. So it's not, it's not necessarily randomness. In fact, I would say if, if you have some randomness that's truly built into your mechanistic model, that's not uncertainty. That is randomness that you would like to possibly quantify, but that wouldn't fall under the, the rubric of uncertainty. And, and I, just, I think the right way to think about uncertainty, whether you're doing me mechanistic model or statistical models, is all of the things that you might not be 100% correct about and that sometimes it's very intuitive and sometimes it's less intuitive to think about how to quantify that, but that, that, that's the starting point. Yeah, so, so that's exactly, I just want to say something about that because I think the question is about, uh, let's say you have a stochastic uh, OD and you have the, uh, the potential term and that parametrically, uh, uh, parameterized as uncertain, so you have to separate extrinsic from intrinsic stochasticity. So lots of biological systems, of, of course, have intrinsic stochasticity, but there are ways to do that. It's like you can use ANOVA in two groups and you can go condition on, on one set of parameters and so you can extract the other. So, so at the hour, you can get the total uncertainty at the, or the total error bar, but actually you can split it and you can say which one comes from the intrinsic and which one will come from the uncertainty, what you call uncertainty. And sometimes they could be totally different, but sometimes there could be even stochastic resonances because of this interaction of extrinsic with, with intrinsic stochasticity. Question. Uh, yeah, I have one question for each of you, and that is, in the ideal world, uh, let's suppose that we have a team and a few time partners here, and all of you have different approaches, different models. What would be the ideal path? What would be the ideal interaction with those partners? Is it to design different collection of data, or to collect more data, or how, you, how do you envision that collaboration with uh, the experimentalists? given your specific model approach? What would be the best ideal world? I assume for Betsy it might be to design some interventions so you can tease out some. Yeah, so actually in the, uh, uh, the, the first talk, uh, uh, you talk about Bayesian optimization. It essentially is a way of designing experiment based on the current model that you have. You can imagine in this case when you have uh, some initial estimation of the network and then that actually helps you to form some hypothesis. And, and for instance, in this particular case, the network tells you that the, this pair of genes may inf interact with the other pair of genes. And you can actually design some experiment to do more intelligent experiments. Otherwise, if you want to explore this combinatorial space of uh, gene gene interaction, that the space is too large. So in some sense, this uh, kind of network is giving you some hypothesis to uh, restrict the set of experiment uh, you want to do and help you quickly zooming into the, maybe the correct uh, interaction network and building a more accurate um, uh, model, okay? So uh, I think there are some uh, 
results coming from statistical literature, if you do this type of sequential experiment design or active experiment design, you can drastically reduce the number of experiments you need to do in order to correctly figure out this network. I think uh, this is going to be a very important, interesting question to investigate. Yeah, I mean, that, that's one of the main things people use Bayesian uncertainty quantification for is if you have, um, you have some inputs and then in a computer model anyway, you would, um, and maybe you have a computer model or some biologic system, you have some inputs and then it's maybe very expensive to run the model and you want to use the emulator, Gaussian process emulator or whatever, non-parametric based emulator to, to choose the best next set of points. And so you can, you can apply the same types of ideas in modeling of biologic systems and so you put in your your combined uh, mechanistic and Gaussian process or other Bayesian non-parametric model, and then you have some loss function. You want to discover something. Or you can choose the next experimental design to kind of optimize that loss function, maybe reduce uncertainty about some key quantity of interest. So there, there's quite an exciting literature on that, and it's been very successful um, in, in, in designing machine learning algorithms, for example, to do automatic tuning um, and, and doing active learning, machine learning, and I think that can be brought over to these kind of biologic mechanistic modeling problems. So, so I have a question. Um, I, I do hope that many of the speakers in the morning session will stay for the afternoon session because we are evaluating cr the model credibility plans of the models in the consortium, and a lot of the discussion is on the uncertainties of the models and how much uncertainty would be acceptable and you know is that something where you all could contribute to that discussion as well other questions let's thank our speakers again it was a great session Good. okay we're going to break for lunch at until 1 and i um, i believe the uh, events Organizers have organized roundtables in the breakout rooms, so if you wanted to have some talks with the speakers and have lunch at the same time, please grab the speakers and bring them to the roundtables and you all can have some uh, further discussions. Thanks. <laughs>